Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Yash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. I'm Jay Dickey. And for the first time since July, we don't have a guest. Yeah, we checked. It's I think July 15th was our last episode without a guest on, so back to the trio. Just going to be us bullshitting in your ears for a while. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be fun. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. Before we start in on our topic, do we want to do our normal reading the sequences thing? I think we have to. We're oh, yeah. contractually it's obligated. Tradition, yeah. Damn, those contracts are harsh, man. Well, at least this this one's fun, so. Yeah. First one was Radical Honesty, which at a the quick overview is that he's much harsher of it than we were on the episode that we talked about. Well, actually, I wasn't on that episode, but when this podcast covered it, uh, we had proponents of it, and I think that I was interested in his take on the idea. Mm-hmm. So, well, let's let's dive right in. We'll link our episode as well. Or you can just search Radical Honesty. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Oh, I haven't updated our uh, archive page in a while, though. I should do that. Yeah. Um, so, yes, <laughs> uh, the Radical Honesty post, he starts off basically just saying uh, Crocker's rules are great. They're a mirror image of Radical Honesty, where you, uh, rather than telling the whole truth to people, you always strive to allow others to tell you the complete truth without being offended, which I just bring up because I know you, Stephen, are a big fan of Crocker's rules and you try to invoke them often. Yeah, we've talked about it here on the show, too. I think, um, I haven't, I don't think I've mentioned it before, you know, in a, to, an, to anybody, but like... I, maybe it would be something to bring up. I think I mentioned an episode or two ago um, when David messaged me and he's like, "Hey, you're you're misusing the word. I think misnomer or something." Mm. And he's like, "Would you mind if I, you know, would you be offended if I corrected him?" I'm like, no, fuck no, tell me. Mm-hmm. Um, I should, you know, I could just have like as my status or like my reply to that could have just been a link to the Wikipedia page for Crocker's <laughs> rule. <laughs> yeah, I, I no, think I it's actually like, I liked what you said about that where you were like. Other people would be like, oh, you're trying to make me look stupid and get all mad about it. And you're like, no, I already look stupid. Now I'll look less stupid if you like tell me what the correct version is. And I'm like, yeah, that's like basically how I wish everyone would respond to criticism where mm-hmm. it's just like, oh, am I doing something wrong? I would like to be better. Please help. Right. And, you know, the, the, I think Crocker's rule is the kind of thing that works with certain kinds of relationships. Yeah. Like, like assuming the person was trying to do that in good faith and not like. Exactly. It's there. <laughs> it's not an open invitation <laughs> to be an asshole. But it's like, do you want do you want feedback on this? and not have me spend 30 minutes dancing around it. It's like, yeah, totally. Just give me the five-second version. So, kind of wish more of the world invoked Crocker's rules just because I have a lot of anxiety sometimes like trying to tell people something that I don't think they're going to take well and mm-hmm. I end up just not doing it and living with, uh, you know, this thing about them that keeps grating on me or whatever. And it's just, it's not great. Oh, yeah. And like 90% of the time, once I do actually bring it up, they're like, oh, yeah, that's that's fine. Thanks for telling me. God damn it! <laughs> this whole time. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, next thing, uh, where you said that he's rather harsh on radical honesty, uh, I the pull the quote that I pulled that I think um, is what you're getting at is he says, "I wonder whether practitioners of radical honesty tend to become more adept at self deception as they stop being able to tell white lies or admit private thoughts to themselves," which is a a hell of a take, which I wish I had thought of myself because. If it becomes really uncomfortable to tell people the truth, but you have this this uh, philosophical commitment to only say the truth, maybe you start lying to yourself without knowing it. Uh, this is, I should mention, they're talking about Blanton's uh, take on like the, the original person that coined the term radical honesty. And that's the one that I disagree with, too, where it was literally just like brain to mouth whatever random ass thought pops into your head, say it, oh, you know, like you go up to Starbucks and you're like, Hey, I'd like a latte. Nice ass, by the way. <laughs> like n- n- that's obviously not the type of radical honesty that I practice or endorse. <laughs> yeah. I want to, I'm glad you reminded me of that. Cause I feel like that's almost a straw man. And like, right. Even if it is the original, like, yeah. that it's still like, all right, cool. Straw you're, man you're, of itself. Yeah. Your original was, was straw as fuck because the, there's a difference between being able to be forthcoming with people in a way that you feel good about and just not having no filter. I feel that even makes you almost like slightly less human to have to literally yeah. remove the filter between your brain and your mouth. That's like that's part of where your introspection and your inner life comes from is the yeah. monitoring of your own thoughts. I've done a lot of uh, work towards being able to say like kind of what you were t- saying a minute ago in Yash, it being hard to give people criticism or like admit certain things. Um but I've had a lot of good progress towards being able to say, like, I have this thought, I don't endorse it, but, like, here, my, I have this anxiety thought that's, like, saying this, can you tell me something, you know, that counters this so I can stop having this thought? Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of thing that you need to have that level of, okay, like, stop, notice you're having a thought, 
do you endorse this thought or not? Where is it coming from? Like, this is, yeah, this, this whole, like, skill that will help improve your self-knowledge, your relationships with others. <laughs> uh, I think it's an interesting sh- social experiment to try to do this sort of thing. And, like, but, yeah, I would never try to do this as, like, a life philosophy. It'd it's be a great just... way to get your ass kicked or slapped or something, right? Yeah. Uh, he suggested only being radically honest with others who have also taken the vow of radical honesty. Which is essentially just like two people who have openly said we can apply Crocker's rules to this conversation. Yeah. Which I feel like is basically what Jace's version of radical honesty entails. Yeah, you want the consent of the other person. Like, um, I don't think the other person has to be practicing radical honesty or whatever, but like, I at least like try to, like, if I'm, you know, real with you... <laughs> Is that gonna offend you, or like, do you, do you want to hear a possibly a, a thought that might be hard to to hear, a difficult thought? You know, like it feels a lot like radical body acceptance. We're like, yeah, it's a good thing, but there's social rules against walking around naked. And if you have accepted your body body that radically that you're comfortable walking around naked, you still got to remember that other people are not in that space yet, and we have laws. <laughs> <laughs> My main thing is that I just think it was fun because this was the first time I'd heard about it. And I feel like the concept has evolved to a much more like likable and defensible position rather than just word vomit. Like, what was your phrase, Jace? Brain to mouth? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. perfect. That, that is not how anyone ought to conduct themselves, I think, in real life. Um, so the, the, the version now seems to be like the grown-up version of it, and I like it more. Yeah. He ends with saying that... Um, I think it was near the end, that maybe radical honesty would be best reserved for matters that are sacred to a rationalist. Uh, then he points out, in some domains, this is already the case. We believe that scientists should tell the whole truth about science, in italics. It's one thing to lie in everyday life. Lie to your boss, lie to the police, lie to your lover. But whoever lies in a journal article is guilty of heresy and will be excommunicated. <laughs> Which, first of all, I love that concept. And up until, you know, maybe a few months ago, I would have cheered. And now, instead, I, I made the crying eyes emoji <laughs> after this. Because, you know, first we have China with their just literal literal blatant um paper mills where they make up fake science to get a a publication i heard about that in the mind killer that was like <sighs> hilarious and so sad and and then just a few days ago west posted in our discord a uh, thing which we'll probably bring up in the next mind killer um about uh the replication crisis mm-hmm. and a guy read uh over 2000 papers and came to the conclusion that most scientists kind of know they, they they have not been misled by p hacking they kind of know their their paper is probably bullshit and everyone else cites papers without even reading the papers they just look at the title and say oh, yep. yeah everybody in the industry knows about it it's yeah. like the replication crisis was pointed out by people in the industry and it's probably like i'm glad that at least it's something that is talked about openly and people are trying to address yeah. and i think even like the chinese paper mills which it sucks but on the other hand it's like oh good this is going to like make it necessary to do replication <laughs> yeah yeah i hope and there's a lot more replication because right now it looks like pretty much everybody is guilty of some level of heresy and no one has been excommunicated and this makes me sad i think a few years communications ag- <laughs> <laughs> i think a few years ago there's an episode of the julia galif on rationally speaking i forget who their guest was so i, I couldn't cite this but it was it was talking about the replication crisis and this this person was involved in a project to like basically say i will i commit to publishing this paper before i do the experiment and so whatever whatever the result is i will publish it and that will help not necessarily just with replication but with uh p hacking mm-hmm. and then they were like yeah w- w- our goal here is to get like a little badge on every site where you go look for stuff and says yep this has the badge of they committed to publishing this yeah cool. pre- pre-registering your hypothesis this is already um it's already a sacred value of science but well, like I'm actually doing say it's it. already being done oh good a lot of uh like in clinical research nice yeah this was this must could have been almost 10 years ago when i heard this episode so don't most journals not publish negative results though yeah i think that's part of the problem yeah um but like any online repository of of journal articles or or of of art of findings i guess yeah Yeah, i mean that's that's what an insane incentive there it'd be one thing for some lesser domain but for science to say no no we're only going to publish the interesting positive stuff it's like what are you fucking talking about Mm -hmm. finding there's nothing there is very valuable Yeah. yeah At the very least, it'll save other people from digging in there unless they find fault with the way we did it, right? Absolutely. God. Yeah. All right, so that radical honesty discussion went a number of places. I, w- I had originally pitched, like, we should just skip this since we did an episode on it, <laughs> but I'm glad we didn't. It was all new stuff. Yeah. 
this one was kind of fun. We don't really want your participation. <laughs> it sounded condescending as hell at a glance. And I think it's it's defensible, especially with like the last sentence in the post. Yeah, I think it's a deliberately inflammatory yeah. title. <laughs> which, um, I don't know. I actually sort of love those. I forget what... It was like BuzzFeed or something. There, there was one of those like major online publications that for a while was doing this trolling article style of actually like the truth is that pickles are terrible and people who eat them are bad people and here's why or something like that like it was just it, like excessively like one person's pet peeve that they like wrote as though okay look we all know that this is <laughs> anyway mike mike Rabiglia does a thing like that when he's talking about late people oh yeah and then he's like and, you know and they're so racist that's the other thing about them too late people are so racist <laughs> <laughs> he just keeps horns affecting everything onto people who can't be on time mm-hmm. um anyway who wants to sum this one up well, I, I suppose I could do it. All right. Somebody has to. All right. Uh, so there was, a, he was at the Singularity Summit. These next two posts are about this uh, conference of people working in AI stuff. And a, a question came from the audience at the end of a panel. And there was an artist asking, hey, uh, what can we do as artists to help in this process? Yeah, well, that they were saying uh, a bunch of speakers had, were like, oh, we should reach out to artists and poets and get them to participate. And All then right. a woman said, I was like, hey, I'm an artist. What can I do? Yeah. And then he says, no, uh, you misunderstand. He, he didn't actually say this, but he's like, this is what my thought process was. Because there was just sort of an uncomfortable silence after that question. <laughs> he says, we're just calling for greater participation by artists. We can get plenty of credit for being enlightened just by issuing the call. If we really cared what artists thought, we would find some artists and ask them questions. <laughs> not call for artists to participate. We don't actually want to hear from artists. We think your opinions are stupid. <laughs> Which, it's kind of mean, but on the other hand, you know, if you're an artist, there's not much input you can give directly on issues of programming and AI. And, like, so in the way that makes this not condescending, look at it from the other side. Like, if there was a, a panel on advancing some mathematical domains, and they were like, Stephen, what do you think? It'd be like, why the fuck are you asking me? <laughs> you don't want my participation. <laughs> right. Or just, like, someone from a completely different domain. Like, if you imagine there's some kind of art theory, like... Yeah. I don't know, like, it's a Monet appreciation conference, and they're like, hey, uh, AI developer, come over here, what do you think about, uh, is is this, like, the Impressionism? Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, they definitely don't want my opinion on that. I went to some art walk a few years ago, and I was just offendedly aghast at how expensive everything was, (laughs) and then I went to the... There, you know, like real museums with real art are fun. I went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, (laughs) and it's like, there were, there were, yeah... There were black and white pictures of like gum melting off the edge of a table. Hmm. And I'm like, squint. Like, that's not art. <laughs> like, is it? If this is art, then what the fuck isn't art? Like, art, we know what art is. It's cool shapes and colors. It's not like, sure, that meant something to somebody, but like, I feel like there's some railing on art later in the um, the sequences, but I have no grasp of it. So anyone who wanted my opinion, they don't want, they don't want really my my participation in the conversation. I think the reason art, one of the reasons art is so expensive, I mean, there's many signaling reasons and stuff, but I think one of them is just that like people almost never buy art. So yeah. for an artist to make any sort of a living at all, they have to charge an outrageously high price so that one of the few times someone buys something, they're like, oh good, I can eat for three weeks. Well, right. Often it's also actually an hourly wage plus the materials used. People don't realize how long it takes to do an oil painting or how much work it is. Uh, like, I have a friend that, is a professional oil painter and sort of like almost sells her stuff at cost if you consider mm. an hourly wage and the amount of the materials and, and like it's paintings that range from like 300 to 700 dollars nice and not just that like the years of practice it took to get that skill yeah that too i mean like i'm, I'm always wages. reminded of the lock picker who comes over here opens your lock up in a matter of under a minute and he's like so that'll be 60 bucks and you're like yeah. for one minute of work and he's like if you want to spend 10 years learning how to pick locks then you also can get paid 60 dollars for one minute of work plus 10 years of learning and yeah, art is very much a thing that takes a long time to master. I don't think that that gum picture took that much time or money to make. Probably not, but what, for what a about gum that, picture, what about mean? that urinal? There was like a yeah, and it's like the what, thing you is, stole a urinal for for a urinal or for a gum picture to be considered art. It has to be framed by someone who already has a huge name as an artist, and that takes a lot of effort to get. I think a lot of the art price too, at least at the high level, is just money laundering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, hey, and you, once you get to the really high levels, yeah. yeah. Hey, you took a picture of whatever, a, a, a drawing of yourself. Great. I'll give you $10 million for it. Wink, oh, wink, man. nudge, what was nudge. That? I'm trying to remember the name of it. There's a movie on Netflix 
that I want to recommend. Uh, it was about uh, like professional visual artists, and it, it's like a murder mystery. But the thing is that it's it's like my, my, the friend I was talking about, who's an oil painter, and I'm like technically an artist. I guess we're watching this and just <laughs> laughing our asses off because the point of the movie is everyone is just so incredibly pretentious and like living in their own weird art world mm. that even though there's like murders and weird shit going on, like it's sort of is in the background of the other drama that's going on in their lives. For, for, uh, uh, let me see if I can find the name of it. For anyone who is not familiar, Jace made the uh, logo for the Basin Conspiracy, but he's just technically maybe sort of an artist, he guesses. <laughs> I mean, I don't uh, do professional art currently. Yeah, but I guess that doesn't did. count. Oh, it's called Velvet Buzzsaw. It's not like you stopped being an actor just because you were only in one movie. Fair. Okay. You professionally um, made this art, and everyone loves it. That's anyway, right. this movie is called Velvet Buzzsaw. It's very weird and funny. I recommended, but right on. Back to the post. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't know. I guess that's sort of the whole point of the post, where it's just sort of we don't need people from like cross genres coming in and giving their opinions. It's not like maybe zero value, but what Elias I think was trying to point out is that like we were doing a signaling thing. Mm. And then, like, I think that this sort of leads into applause lights. Yeah. Did, did either of you have more to say about participation? Pretty much all I had. Yeah. I mean, he, he mentions how, like, bizarrely, uh, not condescending, but how uncomfortable it would be for someone to show him an art and be like, say something and be like, oh, it's beautiful. I love the symmetry. No, no, say something mathematical. You're a mathematician. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's like, I don't have anything on like that to say. Like, what are, you, what are you asking? What are you soliciting my opinion in that domain for? It's just... So like if you, even if you reverse it, that's I think he put that in there. So it's not just seeming like he's besmirching one area. He's saying this this does work in reverse. Like you yeah. can't just like ask somebody for a token opinion. I didn't from... think this as a dig on art at all. I just yeah, I think that was he was trying to make sure that he wasn't like being misrepresented that way either. Totally. But, I, um, I kind of like how he gave an example of them doing applause lights by saying we call an artist participation, <laughs> and then the very next uh, post is called applause lights. Yeah, I actually forgot about, um, we don't want your participation, but Applause Lights is one of those ones that, once you hear it, you'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another one about the Singularity Summit, and one of the speakers called for democratic multinational development of artificial intelligence. Yes. And so Eliezer asked for some more details, outlined some specific scenarios, like, with more like this or more like this? And the speaker was like, I, I, I don't know. I, what? <laughs> yeah, I think the two the two scenarios were almost worth laying out. Let me, uh, I want to find the whole thing. Basically, it was like, would you rather have an AI that is built by everybody, like they all get to vote on how it's made, or like once it's made, every human in the world is given a cell phone where they can answer some questions or something. And that that was the second option, where like just everybody on the planet gets to vote on how this works out. Yeah. And the first option was more like a committee of representatives. He actually something. says, uh, suppose a group of rebel nerds develops an AI in their basement and instructs the AI to poll everyone in the world, dropping cell phones to anyone who doesn't have one and do whatever the majority says <laughs> which do you think is more democratic and would you feel safe with either yeah and the first option he gave was something like a united nations yes com committee something designed by committee yeah. always a great idea and the guy's like excellent I, products yeah and the guy basically had no answers for him and then Eliezer says uh, in the post, look, the substance of a democracy is the specific mechanism that resolves policy conflicts. If all groups had the same preferred policies, there would be no need for democracy. We would automatically cooperate. The resolution process can be a direct majority vote or an elected legislature or even a voter sensitive behavior of an artificial intelligence. But it has to be something. <laughs> what does it mean to call for a democratic solution if you don't have a conflict resolution mechanism in mind? I think it means that you have said the word democracy, so the audience is supposed <laughs> to cheer. It's not so much a propositional statement or belief as the equivalent as it is as, sorry, it's not so much a propositional statement or belief as the equivalent of the applause light that tells a studio audience when to clap. This case is remarkable only in that I mistook the applause light for a policy suggestion with subsequent embarrassment for all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and if just in case you don't get the reference, uh, often like live action TV, or I don't know if they do this anymore, probably, but like they will instruct the audience when to react in the way that they want them to react to whatever the speaker's saying. So there used to actually just be a, a big, like, was it a neon sign that just said applause and they would light it up and yeah. then darken it? <laughs> that, I, I mean, I guess they, they probably still have applause lights for shows like um, the Colbert. I was going to say for late night shows with yeah. yeah. audiences. Kind of laughter. Did, oh, well, no, they do. They still film them in front of. Yeah, they'd film in Did front they? of a live audience. 
those types of shows, the the whole David Letterman, Jay Leno style shows huh. where they bring people on and interview them and have comedians and shit. I don't know very much about that, but uh, I do remember recently I was watching a show about the creation of a show. <laughs> it was meta. And uh, they had like, it was actually, I think like six people sitting in a row, like in front of the stage, but like, and I guess the rest was CGI'd in or they only ever like just turned the camera slightly. So you saw sort of the backs of the first people's heads, huh. but it was supposed to look like there was a studio audience when they're like, yeah, it's weird. Cool. It's but- weird that like, the whole idea of a studio audience is weird, but anyway, I'm getting off topic. It's, I mean, I'm glad we're not doing this in front of people. Um, so the, I like his. his have Drake just like sit here and watch us. <laughs> Every now and then we'll flash an applause light and he claps. <laughs> Hold up a sign. Yeah. Um, I like the reversal test to see if this is an, like to check if something is an applause light. And it's like, just a. Uh, Put if someone says something and you just reverse the the intent of the statement, is it completely pointless and ridiculous? If so, it's probably an applause light. So he gives, for example, suppose someone says we need to balance AI risks and opportunities of AI. If you reverse the statement, you would get we shouldn't balance the risks and opportunities of AI. <laughs> Since the reversal sounds abnormal, the unreversed statement is probably normal, implying it doesn't does not convey new information. It's just an applause light. Yeah, um, I, I've seen. Uh, applause lights in real life and i think i probably brought this up years ago when it happened and i mean you, you see them all the time yeah but especially I was, after reading this article suddenly they're everywhere i was i was just at a party at someone's house years ago and we were playing like cards against humanity or something and people would just say things that were like mm-hmm. if you asked it's all uh, applause lights yeah and it was so like it's kind of unnerving. anti-applause lights if it's cards against humanity it depends on the group you're playing with yeah, they would be like, I mean, oh, like, you know, not in America or something that was like, pub, you know, like yeah. prison something. And then like everyone laughs and some people might have literally clapped. Maybe that was made it so seem so <laughs> surreal. And it's like this. That's like the easiest pot shot joke. And it's you're not you're not it, like, again, you're not trying to do this. Wasn't like the same thing as like a reversal test. This this wouldn't pass that. But like it was just so weird. Just like, like it, it was like really like cheap. Against humanity. Yeah. Like I. It was apples to apples originally. Like, mm-hmm. I, there's so many parties I went to that, like, everyone was like, oh my god, let's play this. It's the funniest thing. I was just like, it's not. It, it's really not. <laughs> I, I've grown to unhate it now because when you only play it, like, maybe once every couple of years, it's pretty good. It's the fact that, like, it seemed to be some the only thing everyone wanted to do for the longest time. And, like, any gathering would devolve into playing cards against humanity. And I was yeah. like, oh god, I'm so sick of it. How many times can you make Hitler jokes? The one time I did find it really funny was when I played it with my parents. Okay. Because they're just so insulated <laughs> from anything that, like, they're like, "What is a bigger, blacker dick?" Yeah, they, they, <laughs> it was funny seeing which things they didn't like recognize or didn't know what to do with, and then also having them like sort of aggressively play a card and they'd just be like, "Oh my god, mom!" Like, <laughs> anyway, yeah, that actually sounds like a lot of fun. Next opportunity I get, I'm going to play with my family, minus my grandmother. I won't, I won't expose her <laughs> so, to maybe apples to apples for grandma. Yeah, we've done that before. Okay, but I feel like Cards Against Humanity would just be really funny. I'll put some <laughs> some horrifying shit out, and they'll they'll be aghast, and it'll make me. Every smile. time you draw cards, my parents would cringe and go, "Oh no, can I put this one back? No, I don't." <laughs> <laughs> Rush Limbaugh's soft, shitty body. <laughs> <laughs> That's mean. That was one of the cards. I know. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's mean, but it, yeah. like a lot of them are mean. Uh, yes, um, they like are. Like a windmill of corpses, like, like just random <laughs> bullshit. It's perfect. Okay. All right. I believe that is all the things we have. And yeah, people who are, who are not familiar with the applause lights concept before now will probably start seeing a lot more of it. And read the post. It's funny. Yeah. All right. For yeah. next time, we have the episodes Rationality and the English Language and Human Evil and Muddled Thinking. Those sound fun. Hell yeah. Everyone buckle up. Or the laundry <laughs> deliver. You know, I don't remember the... I probably remember the content. I just remember the titles of either of these. It's totally fun. Cool beans. All right. Was there anything else that we want to t- touch on, or are we going into our topic? I think we're ready to dive yeah, in. going into the topic. Okay. All right. So, so we're kind of trying to, like, before recording, we're doing our usual pre, like, pre-recording like pre bullshit chat, and we kept sort of being like, oh, wait, I'm talking about <laughs> this topic. So, yeah, let's... We got this uh, listener mail. Uh, titled why are human minds so frustrating which is a good question um uh does anyone i want to summarize it if yeah I, i'll, I'll, I'll summarize a bit um so an anonymous uh was it sweden yes yeah, swedish uh listener wrote in person from sweden person from sweden wrote in and basically like uh in a sentence 
what are some good mental health tips? But I don't feel like that encompasses the bulk of the emails. So like, this is what I replied with, and I totally agree. Like with COVID um, currently, but also both uh, intelligence and depression is overrepresented in our community. This seems like a, a permanent problem and like a, a pertinent one right now, like given how depressing the fucking world is right now. I think pertinent is what they meant. I think so. Yeah. But in any case, like just to touch on that, Colorado has been smoky for the last six weeks, eight uh, yeah, weeks. I have no idea. Everything's on fire and... Sucks. Yeah, so like we haven't been able to go outside and get fresh air. We haven't been able to go do anything socially in six or eight months, however long it's been. And uh, it's it's a great time to be depressed. Like, it, I mean, well, let me take that back. It's a terrible <laughs> time to be depressed, but it's depression is very much in vogue right now because everything's super fucking depressing. I saw that uh, puppy sales had doubled. Huh, that's during... actually a positive. I well, eh. assuming they're getting from a, from like uh, rescues. Well, no, they're like. The, it specifically said like puppy prices from breeders has oh. doubled because of de- high demand for dogs during lockdown. It it worries me that uh, after the lockdown ha- is over, maybe the puppies won't yeah. have as much, uh, you know. That's what I'm worried about, too. I'm always worried when people suddenly like animal sales are up, like, oh, it's Easter and like bunny sales are up. And I'm just like, great, everyone's going to buy their like kid a bunny. And then they're going to realize that this isn't actually a stuffed animal. And also, bunnies are mean. Yeah. I love I love bunnies. They're. And they live so fucking well. They're long. incredibly, like, I don't know, psychologically complex, socially interesting. Uh, but, like, they scream. <laughs> they make these, like, growling noises. They will bite and kick you. They, uh, they they're strong. They aren't potty trainable, so they just kind of poop everywhere with, with their caged up. Yeah. Although, luckily, their poop is, like... Yeah. It doesn't smell, and it's these, like, little BBs. <laughs> it's herbivore poop, so, <laughs> yeah, it's dry. pretty much fine. But still, it's annoying. But, yeah. I know that some places don't sell bunnies around Easter, which is nice. My thing with the dogs is that I just assumed, because I'm just too rosy-eyed about the world, that <laughs> once you have a dog, and you've known dog love, you'll never, like, start neglecting it. Because who could ever do that? Well, right? also, I recently read a post which I would like to share at some point. I'll, I'll put a link on if I can find it again. That's it. basically most dogs have been bred uh, throughout human dog coevolution times to have a job. Like they're yeah. supposed to go outside and do stuff. And a lot of dogs that are uh, bought nowadays are bought from those breeds, but they're kept in houses. And so they get neurotic. They don't get enough exercise. They don't have a job and they have anxiety their entire lives. And it's terrible. So it's actually a great, like if yeah, you don't have goes... a large property, like a ranch or something, you should probably buy a lap dog breed of dog. The kinds of dogs that are bred to, you know, lay around the house and be be social rather than Shih Tzus. do things. Yeah, Shih Tzus are the best lap dogs. <laughs> Shih Tzus are great. They're they're so dumb. I love them. <laughs> yeah, that also helps that they they can't get neurotic or bored because they're just too stupid. Uh, we had a Shih Tzu growing up, but <laughs> my brother has a Border Collie, and yeah, it's it's got some <laughs> border neurotic. Border Collie's like the worst dog to have as an indoor dog. Oh well, god! And yeah. and I mean, they go outside every day, but she is a little neurotic, and mm-hmm. she like she is obsessive about reflective lights on the ground. Like if there's prisms or like a cell phone <laughs> reflecting, she goes for the carpet like hardcore. Like huh. she she has the need to like hunt and herd whatever she just saw, but she never yeah. gets to hone that urge. Yeah, because she's a herding animal. But I think that she's you know she's had a good life. Mm-hmm. Um, it's yeah. just she hasn't had. She hasn't been able to maximize what she's been built to do. Not to say that people shouldn't, like, if you're prepared for the responsibility of having whatever dog you want, then, like, by all means, do. I'm just, like, yeah. talking shit on people that, you know, are like, oh, it's Cocker Spaniel. Look, it's, it's got the puffy ears. Or it's- adopt a cat. If you can't take your dog hunting regularly or doing whatever it was meant to do, it's going to be an, not... Or simulate those activities. Yeah. You know? Like, you could take your dog to the park and have it, like... And throw a ball for it to catch like for a couple hours as get long as exercise. you're willing to do it at least like twice a week yeah. yeah otherwise get 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 a dog that is meant for being indoors i'm just saying cats are fun too we got a cat in december last cats year are, yeah. yeah cats are perfect yeah what's the the dog that the queen likes those are generally... corgis yeah corgis are oh, really lap corgis. doggy they are don't they, do much i actually think that they're really intelligent and get bored really easily yeah they are oh, yeah. they are among the smart tier of dogs mm, you wouldn't think that because how adorable and, and cute their faces are yeah. Yeah. yeah but they're that's the dog we would plan to get eventually when we have a yard but okay. like right now we we have i mean we have access easily to greenery but not just somewhere for it to go run around and run circles in the grass you know yeah. so what were they originally bred for the corgis anyone know i should know because i've i, I, I have it's watched a, a lot of okay. stuff about the corgis sure. Um, but it's not coming to mind. Weren't wiener dogs made to like chase down ferrets and yeah. other burrowing creatures? That's why they're all, so long. Pretty much, I think all dogs had a purpose uh, when they initially like separated them into distinct breeds. Yeah. Like the dogs were tools for most of well, tools well, and much companions, all animals but were, like yeah. yeah. But this is the tool that we use to turn grass into meat. <laughs> yes. 
But um, as Lady Gash pointed out, like animals also um, have mental health issues. Yes. <laughs> so we are still on topic. That's right. <laughs> no, I was actually just reading. Um, it was a book called Animal Madness, and I'm only a couple chapters in, but uh, it's talking about how structurally similar, especially a lot of mammals' brains are to human brains, and the animals mirror many of the same mental illnesses that humans have mm. uh, anxiety, depression. <laughs> there was um, a series of books that uh, the nurse at my work keeps in her office. Um, and it was like, all birds have anxiety. Mm. All dogs have ADD. <laughs> all cats have autism. <laughs> and they had like an excellent picture. You know, they're like children's books, like board books. And there's just an excellent picture on the front of each one. Like the old birds have anxiety. It was a picture of like a snowy owl with like its eyes really wide. <laughs> just like a comical sort of like wide-eyed face but yeah like i love it <laughs> you said at the very beginning that like our community is particularly prone to depression i was i've always wondered about that like we certainly say that and i think we're more open about our depression but no nah, we I pulled think, it but like uh, i wanted to bring up the slate story codex uh i kind of always assumed that everyone has the same mental health issues and they just don't admit it no there's um distinct trends like uh at least like Scott pulls a pretty large number um, from his Slate Strike Codex community uh, surveys that he does yearly. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of things that are overrepresented uh, and underrepresented in the rationalist community, more so than like if you compare it to just like numbers of polls of the general community. Um, a lot of mental illnesses, uh, LGBTQ. Uh, but if the general community, uh, the general population is basically always lying about how happy they are then that would be reflected in polls too they'd be like yeah no we're, well, we're totally great I, uh, mm. like i've never gotten to know someone and they're talking about diagnoses i think yeah. like they, they had actually i think distinguished or differentiated in the poll um do you have a do you have you know add do you have a diagnosis for add are you on an add medication do you not have add but do you self-diagnose and then also they had like take the test and there were the various um, diagnostic criteria tests that they actually use in psychiatry that actually uh, diagnosed me with ADD before I was officially diagnosed. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to move on with this uh, to kind of get us more to the meat of this. Um, so uh, I like the 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 person who wrote it and said, to be clear, I'm not asking you to solve everyone's problems. <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank goodness, because that'd be hard. But uh, and I and I agree with the sentiment. That's why I really wanted to cover this in the episode. But hearing about others' experience could definitely help with the parts of the community like me who feel isolated and can't handle talking to people who, frankly, just don't want who just don't want to get it. <laughs> um, and like that—that's the thing is, especially now where everyone's at home all the time. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what the situation is like in Sweden. I think it can't be worse than here. Um, but yeah, we're closing in on 200,000 deaths uh, in the U.S. from COVID, and like so, we're you know I haven't been to work since the last week of february um it's weird you know you can do video calls and stuff with your coworkers, but that's never the same um because it's just so easy to not you don't have to engage yeah so all that social engagement goes completely to to crap um i like this he says uh or they say rather i'm a physicist and when I've studied some psychology, I've gotten so frustrated at the hand wavy nature of it. Mm -hmm. Damn it, why is, is it too much to ask that we clearly define problems and find solutions? Why must our monkey brains be less intuitive and consistent than quantum mechanics? Because <laughs> they're built on quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> Bad news, psychology is, uh, when compared to physics, uh, like, almost crank science. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's, sci it's science, it's scientific, but... Like physics is the sta the gold standard for me, um, right. especially if you were talking about p hacking earlier. Like uh, the you know p values in psychological studies are like 0. 0.05, and I think in physics it's like 0. 0.0005. I forget, <laughs> but like a one in twenty chance of this being a uh, chance in physics would be you'd be laughed out the door, right? right. Um, but you're allowed to publish a paper with saying, yeah, there's a twenty, there's a five percent chance that this is a uh, you know. Uh, complete randomness. Yeah. It's like, what are you fucking kidding me? Get back here with real numbers. <laughs> so that said, we have made strides in uh, the the field, and it depends on you know what subfield you're looking at too. Um, yeah, you know, social sciences are harder because you can't do random you know experiments on large populations that involve like, well, what happens if you uh, 
improperly nourish somebody from ages you know zero to five like right. you, you so those those sorts of things you just have to look at the data that is available that's part of what makes psychological science and social science harder is that you can't do the proper kinds of experiments and before we continue real quick you actually have a degree in psychology yeah oh yeah i suppose so yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you have some relevant knowledge here yeah i went more for the cognitive psych stuff not the psychotherapy stuff mm. Um, but you have to take all the things to get a degree because that's how degrees work. Oh, they would make um, you take like the old Freudian bullshit stuff? The what? The old Freudian bullshit stuff? I'm not sure what that is. No. Freudian, oh, like Freudian. Want... I thought you said 40 and. Oh, uh, um, no. Yeah, I mean, you hear about Freud. Uh, I don't think I was ever... Oh, but they didn't make you like seriously study his stuff. No, I don't think so. I mean, okay. like you you become familiar, like, kind of like my... Like why... the history of psychiatry. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. You learn Freud about... and Jung and... Yeah, I learned about it more in, in history of psych classes than I did like an actual psych uh, practice stuff. Okay. Um, now it's all about cognitive behavioral therapy, which I think is the, if we have anything like a, a silver bullet for this, it's that. Um, and I know Jace knows a lot more about CBT because cognitive behavioral therapy has a lot of, of <laughs> syllables um, than I do. And I want to get into that at length at some point in here, so... Yeah, although we're not going to try to solve everyone's problems. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, <laughs> but, uh, may, maybe promising a silver bullet is too much. But I, I do think that, like, in fact, this I'm glad this brought to mind. I was listening to an interview with Jonathan Haidt on the drive over, and he wrote or co-wrote a book called The Happiness Hypothesis, which might be worth reading. I haven't actually read it, but the way he sells it, it sounds very valuable. He talks about, um, the like, the values of meditation, CBT, and Prozac. Okay. And like the, these all work for different, you know, populations across different cases. And the combination of them probably works for many people in many cases. Um, the again, combination intends to be what works best. Right. Yeah, exactly. Just like with, with most any sort of ailment, you know, like what do I do to fix my sore ankle? Well, you take anti-inflammatory meds and you do physical therapy for it. Like, you know, the more things you're doing to make it better, the more chances you have of it working. But yeah, many of those complement each other as well. Exactly. So we'll we'll get into that. But I, I did have a recommendation for something that I haven't read personally, but I it was sold to me very well by its author who stands to make money from it being sold, um, called The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. For what it's worth, I think he's a sane guy who didn't write this to make money. He wrote it because he was very interested in it. So um, at least there's that. Anyway, I don't mm -hmm. know where to go from here. Well, um, what the person, what our Swede friend was asking for is a conversation sort of about mental health with like hearing others experiences so uh i think something funny that happened was that we were trying to record this a few days ago and all of mm. us were too depressed to do it <laughs> <laughs> so we had to like cancel it and then put it off well there's also like technical difficulties and stuff but um but we could have gotten around those but like definitely can relate i mean i am not to say that i was like happy to get this email you know of like someone struggling with depression but at the same time it's sort of like yeah this is really relevant especially right now i'm dealing with a lot of psych stuff myself um I love my, a lot of my friends and partners are and it, they're like you know stuff exacerbated by covid but it's lifelong stuff too um i'm just like starting to finally get diagnosed properly and seek proper treatment for things that i've had my whole life because i was raised in a family that did not believe mental illness was real um and like I, as even a religious though, thing or no that it, like my, it was i don't know my family is descended from puritans uh we're actually like offshore of a couple of like dry towns where you're just you, they don't even let you bring alcohol there mm -hmm. alcohol is illegal <laughs> so like very much like um stoicism hard work self-sacrifice like sort of whether or not they're t tying it to religious beliefs because uh my mom's super religious my dad's not but like they both have the sort of cultural beliefs and uh it's also about like no whining no complaining uh basically no no like asking people for help because that's a sign of weakness mm. and Essentially yeah, toxic, toxic masculinity slash to toxic say, boomerism in a nutshell. It sounds yeah. very much like a very masculine kind of thing. There's like, yeah, they also don't believe in science-based medicine. So like we never went to doctors, uh, very rarely got anything stronger than aspirin <laughs> regardless. Uh, luckily, like me and my siblings never got like seriously injured or ill. Yeah. Um, although I do suspect at that point, like, my parents would have gone to the doctor but maybe it's because of all your ancestors that had gotten seriously injured or ill died instead of reproduced <laughs> so now you've got the no illness genes 
I mean, it does. It kind of works. Um, as long as you don't mind all the death along the way. Yeah, uh, or like you're you're unlikely to die in the 21st century right now from like you know measles or whatever. Mm -hmm. Again, if we had gotten like sick enough that we required hospitalization, I'm sure my parents would call an ambulance. Like they're not they're not fanatics. Yeah. My mom still goes to the doctor for, well, it was two. <laughs> she has a certain, well, she has a hyperthyroidism. I wonder if my parents would have gotten any of us kids a blood transfusion if we needed it to live. Oh, yeah. Uh, you had a whole Jehovah's Witness thing going on. Yeah. Like, from what I know of them now, I think they probably would have been like, no, fuck it, give them the, the blood transfusion. But it's weird because when I was a kid and I really believed the stuff, I would have been like, no, I'd rather die. Don't give me the blood transfusion, you know? Which That's is horrifying. kind of... Also, you would be it, a minor kind of and you'd like, be yeah. subject to whatever they decided, though. Yeah, exactly. But it kind of um, reinforces the whole... The way you get people to convert is they don't have to actually convert. They just fake it for long enough that their children and grandchildren don't realize that they're faking it and really internalize those things. Mm, like yeah. the church plays a long game. I remember what a mind whim it was for you, what, five years ago or whatever, when you mm -hmm. learned your dad didn't believe this shit, and then like a year later your mom said something similar, <laughs> oh yeah. and you're like, then what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and wasn't the answer something along the lines, like, well, we wanted just a it's community to fit in when we got here? Yeah. yeah. I was like, then pick a less crazy one. Come on, guys. Well, you, this I could mean, have been a lot easier on us. Of course, the more crazy the community, the harder mm, of a, like, the, the exactly. tighter of a community it is. That's what but, I, yeah. I, yeah, I have to say, um... The new place I just moved into, there's a ton of Mormons that live there, mm -hmm. and they just seem like the happiest, nicest people. If I didn't know... <laughs> That's my experience with Mormons, too. Same. They might be the only people that don't have depression in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> they're, I mean, again, they're, they're humans, there's variants in their population, I'm sure, but yeah. like they, they seem to be... You don't hear a lot about like Mormon aggression or like the Mormon you know war on this or whatever. No, they're, they seem just chill as fuck. And like even like everyone that I've interacted with, their the families are all nice. They're very welcoming. They're very like, I, I, as far as neighbors to go, it's hard to think of better. Uh, I mean, if I if I had to pick a a, group, a religious denomination of neighbors, I think I'd pick Mormons in a hot second. It, it depends. Like in Salt Lake City, apparently, uh, gay couples would be attacked by like church elders if they were on on a park bench holding hands or something. Fair point. Let me uh, let me caveat that and say, if, if, uh, depending on who I was, that'd be my favorite neighbor. Obviously, yeah. yeah if you're depends on how much power they have, yeah, like, like if, any other group, when they're the minority, they're nice. When they suddenly have the power, it's like, oh yeah, being a different religion is against the law. Yeah, I think yeah. fifty years ago, We're black people limit weren't how many opacas you can have. <laughs> right, black people weren't human, weren't recognized as human by the Mormon Church until like nineteen seventy four or seventy six or some bullshit. Yikes! They had, wow, a, they had was a new, it that long? they had a new revelation. Okay, that oh yeah, it looks like looks like black people are are human after all. Okay. Not not right, not not just like inferior human, like every other brand of racist asshole, but yeah. like literally non-human. Okay, and it's like okay, yeah. So don't get me wrong, you know, there there's the magic underwear and the craziness involved, but as far as just polite neighbors, I don't know. Maybe I'm yeah. being too general, but well, I, I was saying yeah, like specifically from the outside, if I didn't know what a Mormon was, and I was just like. Man, there's all these very well dressed young white gentlemen here offering to help me carry groceries and saying hello mm -hmm. and seeming just very like wholesome and playing ping pong together and being like, Hey, come play ping pong with us and I'm like Literally hey. every Mormon I've met in real life has been great. But yeah. again, I've only met them in in context outside of Salt Lake City where they were not. The, the, the ruling majority. Sorry. The reference to the alpaca thing is that when Phoenix and I went on a road trip one time, we stayed at an Airbnb that was also an alpaca farm, and we found out the family was a bunch of former Mormons who got in trouble with the local Mormon government because they were there was some power struggle going on between the two different sects, and the one decided to punish like this group by trying to limit how many alpacas they could have and they like that was like the straw that broke the alpacas back ha -ha. that's awesome and so they like rallied together all their friends and overthrew the government <laughs> so they could have as many alpacas as they wanted that's how shit gets in the bible it's like do not mix uh, clothes of two different uh, fabric types because those assholes over there were trying to grab power so you know what it's part of our religion now i love it um yeah. like i feel like one of the things that helped me confront uh mental health issues in my own life is like the the writer wrote about you know the sense of isolation and like if you feel like you're the only one with these problems it's really easy to like think that there's not an avenue towards resolution and like that that's why i'm a big fan of just being open about it mm -hmm. and you know talking with people about you know and there's a difference between like just shoving it in people's faces but like not hiding it um you know if anyone asks me i'm, I'm very forthcoming about it um yeah, there's a lot of stigma against mental illness. Uh, 
less and less now, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I don't know. Certainly our parents' generation, you know, the ones who didn't believe mental health was a thing, right. they, they're, they, they shouldn't, back then. we don't, we don't want the participation in this conversation anyway, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, my, my peers anyway, um, seem to be more willing to talk about it and. Yeah, you like, work with like a bunch of programmers that are your age though, right? Oh, I didn't mean range. my, my coworkers, I meant my, my oh, peers, yeah, like my, my, well, in my, my age group, community, et cetera, um, like, and, and, and I have a pretty small monkey sphere, so maybe that's part of it, but. Um, in any case, like, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like actually just deliver something like actionable that is generalizable to just about everybody. And the main thing is that like, if, especially if it's depression, it's so easy for you to like, especially when you've had it for years, I've, I've been clinically depressed for something like a decade. Mm -hmm. Um, and when it first set in, I'm like, this fucking sucks. I need to fix this. Tried some medication, didn't really work. Um, it also set in around the same time as my chronic pain. So I'm assuming there's some really, you know, causal arrow there. Yeah. Um, your issues are in your tissues, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> just it, remember it, that guy. I was trying to remember that all day yesterday. Was, like, that's hilarious. Uh, it, it's a good line. I mean, I, I assume the fact that like, oh, suddenly now I'm physically limited and, you know, tired all the time. That probably pay, played a big role. Yeah. But, uh, like, you know, I tried something for, I tried uh, antidepressants for a year. It didn't really work. So I went off it and then I was like, oh, I'll just try and muscle through it. And then it wasn't until... This year in January, where I'm like, you know what, let's fuck, you know, let's just get back in there, start talking to people. And I went to a psychologist who I didn't like, and so that's gonna be another thing about like seeking treatment. If you're not vibing with your with your therapist, like get a different one. Yeah, shop around to start with too. And I I think for even for me knowing this, it still felt a little awkward breaking up with the guy, saying, you know, I, I don't think this is working out. I'm gonna uh, look for another practi practitioner because yeah. they they have a different like billing code for like last visit so you like you kind of want to tell them it's your last visit because okay. they'll ask you um and it feels like you're dumping them and it's yeah. like it's not you it's me but like mm -hmm. the thing is it's their job they get it and if they if they're good at their job they'll say you know what i think i know somebody who will work better for you and they'll point you in the right direction um the guy i was seeing was not a cognitive behavioral therapist he was just a sounding board and the way i you know and i i, like I was therapy right yeah and like I, I told him very politely i was like you know i haven't had a conversation in here that i haven't had by myself already like I want, I want this to be something where I'm gaining something from it. I, you know, again, this is, this is all conversations I've had either with my friends or by myself. And like, I need, I need like steps. I need advice or whatever. Um, are you on antidepressants right now? I am. Okay. Yeah. I started at the beginning of August. Uh, I actually just went to my primary care physician telling him like, this is what I want. And, uh, and it helps a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm, yeah. I want to get to that too. But, um, if you know, it's it's probably better to do a combination of therapy and drugs if you're going to yeah. do uh, them. But right now, I guess virtual therapy would be an option. But I, you know, whatever, I'll get around to that. But yeah, I'm like, doing virtual. Uh, actually, doing internal family systems therapy with a psychologist that I just see on Zoom or one of those things. It's a like medical HIPAA compliant Zoom. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, so that's that's an option. I think. Um, so I've been I've been on antidepressants for more of my life than I haven't. Like the first fifteen years, no antidepressants. The next twenty five years, on antidepressants. And uh, so I, I'm definitely a proponent of they help. They they take the edge off and they make other progress possible. But also, like you can't just do antidepressants because that does nothing. Uh, you need other things in combination. Because I mean, humans aren't just the brain chemicals. Like yeah, you need the brain chemicals to work, but if you're still like not doing anything with your life or not getting socialization or something, then it's, it's, you're still going to be feeling bad all the time, even with antidepressants. They're just going to correct some basic biological issues without all the other stuff that needs to be fixed. Yeah. And they're not even necessarily correcting some biological issues. Our understanding of mental illness is shifting quite rapidly. Um, so like I'm actually undergoing neurofeedback where they, will target specific areas of the brain and apply current to them and do an exercise where there's a reward signal sent when you are able to bring your brain waves in line with what the healthy pattern is or the one they're trying to encourage. They're able to tackle multiple issues. They're working on ADD, anxiety, and sleep by targeting like the thalamus, uh, the other parts of the brain that I can't currently remember. <laughs> it's, it's a process, um, but I can see it working. Uh, and I could also see the brain maps that they scanned. Uh, I, we went over them. I went over them with the technician. And it's just, uh, in a way, it was very affirmatory. Um, 
just to see like okay like so here's your brain's attention center and Mm -hmm. uh you see the big orange dot right there that's a deficiency so here's the like typical add pattern and it's like look see i can overlay them they're almost identical i'm just like yeah cool okay so that's not just me like being lazy i had such a like inability to admit to myself that i had add too and i've don't know where that came from probably it was just like the upbringing thing that i just absorbed but like part of it was just that i know i already have anxiety and depression and ocd and now like transgender stuff going on i'm like i can't have another thing on top of that that's <laughs> I, i'm not that much of a special snowflake or something like that i was like it's also like pretty clear that my dad has undiagnosed add and i was and i, I like most i'm sort of like a mini version of my dad i seem to have gotten a lot of my dad's side genes mm. and like Right, that's too many flaws. Where's the bonuses that I get to compensate? Well, I do have bonuses. Uh, apparently, oh, I, my high beta is good. Well, it's actually funny. The the part of my brain that controls drive, motivation, vision, etc. Like the ones that, like, oh yeah, a lot of like artists and entrepreneurs and stuff have like this. Uh, well, it's actually a low beta. And but like they're like, but then you've got all this blockage here in the part of the brain that actually like so the executive function part of the brain's all mm. fucked up. <laughs> so I'm like, oh okay, that like accounts for a lot of my like. I have lots of highfalutin goals and drive and wanting to do this, that, and the other thing, and then I crap out halfway through (laughs) all the time. (laughs) Like, yeah, this this explains basically all my issues. It's right there. It's in in the brain maps. Before I interrupted you to do the quick digression on uh, uh, antidepressants, you you're in. Are you in therapy again right now? Uh, No, no. Okay, Um, because I've I've done therapy multiple times throughout my life, and. Like, a couple times it helped me to make a big decision that I was reluctant to make, but in general, I've never found it to be very helpful, so I've just kind of stopped even trying. Is that a bad idea? Like, was I just doing it wrong? How, how does therapy work so it is good? I'm not an expert on that. I think, I mean, part of it is, like, you want to find somebody who can, in, in my, it's, people want different things. Like, talk therapy is a thing where just where somebody needs somebody to just to untangle to. their brain also. exactly like a lot of people just don't even know that the way that they're thinking and behaving is pathological or yeah. they're unwilling to admit it and mm. like some people just need someone just to talk to or just you know somebody who won't tell their friends or their family or whatever mm-hmm. um like for me what i want is like actionable steps and so the reason i'm not in therapy now is partly because the world is on pause but also mm-hmm. like i have already a lot of the techniques that i would want to learn from a therapist anyway basically the cognitive behavioral therapy techniques where i mean and that's that's again where meditation comes in as well like just being aware when my mind is spiraling and like most people i mean this is just the high level thing of mindfulness but most people go most of their day not realizing their brain is running through thoughts all day and you know once in a while you'd be like oh i've been thinking about that for a long time or somebody will point out be like you seem anxious and you're like oh yeah i've been anxious all day because i've been thinking about this but for the most part, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at this, I think it was something that I had like an early aptitude for because I had to be physically mindful of my body since I was like 14, 13, I don't know, whenever I hurt my I hurt my neck when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And so like I needed to make sure that I wasn't like in a good posture, so I'd be kind of doing like constant mindfulness check-ins of my body. Um, and it's just another step there to check in how your brain's doing. And so like I went through like a very mild trauma in like August and... I, my mind like continues to race on those thoughts most like several times a day and it, it's nice just to catch those thoughts and like oh yeah you're doing that thing again just think about something else um, or you know do you want to finish that thought and then get it out because sometimes just like grabbing the wheel and shoving it doesn't quite work but saying all right last you get your 90 more seconds then you're done with this um, yeah. do people I think people's approaches are different and that's not very like actionable but um, like so the when I wanted to do medication, this was first week of August, I think. Um, and basically I had just contacted my primary care physician and I asked if I could just do it over the phone. And they were like, no, you need to come in. I'm like, are you sure? Because this is something that, you know, I've got a, uh, pulse oximeter and a blood pressure cuff here and a scale Mm -hmm. for all my vitals that you guys are (laughs) going to take. I can give you those over the phone too. But I did end up going in and, uh, said, look, I want Adderall or I want Wellbutrin. I know both make me feel more awake, and that's mainly my, my main complaint. I resolved the... Uh, oh, I, I ameliorated the, uh, the my poor ability to sleep like a year ago. So I'm sleeping better, but I'm still fucking tired all the time. So I want to kind of tack this from the other side. And um, Wellbutrin is... Uh, first of all, it works because I'm depressed, but also, um, like, 
it's or rather it, it's an S D R I yeah selective dopamine and serotonin reuptake inhibitor yeah it's dopamine one but the main feedback i'd heard from people who had it is that it makes you feel more energized and so far that's been the case for me it it sort of does by backdoor routes what adderall does directly Perfect. adderall adds more dopamine to your system will be true and prevents you from reuptaking the dopamine you're already making great yeah i mean it works for me i mean uh you did mention the sleep thing just now i guess i mean we've mentioned this before but i get it, it since this is on topic it'd probably be good to hit real quick like the very low hanging fruit um oh, yeah. get plenty of sleep like get your sleep schedule on track that is a big thing for mental illness and uh get some exercise like yeah exercise are... diet meditation sleep we were just talking uh, about how like dogs need their exercise they need a job if they're the right breed i mean humans are also of the mammal breed and we need some exercise which a lot of us don't get in the modern day because our jobs consist of us sitting at desks and it's hard you know as far as like why i felt like this was a, a a uh, topic I wanted to hit so immediately was because there's a super pertinent, you know, I can't even, I used to go for walks at lunch and I can't even do that now because the air is complete dog shit. Yeah. Right now there's a hint of blue sky, but it's the second time I've seen blue sky this week. Yeah. Um, like I, it, my throat's been, you know, you wake up to, you know, scratchy throat, water, you know, itchy eyes and stuff. Cause there's smoke in the air constantly. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a very local, well, a mostly local issue, but like California's got it too. That's yeah. why Phoenix moved here originally because the smoke was too bad, and now they're just like Phoenix so like, brought great. the smoke here. <laughs> well, Son of a bitch! They are a burning giant hawk thing. Mm. But it just it just seemed like even now I can't even do like the the exercise stuff that I like to do, like just the light cardio, of just being out and enjoying the sun, walking around. Yeah. But like like I said, I think the main thing it, for me, and this this only happens when in my experience and from people I've talked to when you've been in it for, for a long enough, when you've been in a depressive state for long enough where it stops feeling like a state and it just feels like the way the world is. Right. Yeah. And you're like, well, there's nothing there to fix. This is just me. I finally just, you know, come to my senses. This is how reality is. Mm. It's not. Um, I, I'm lucky that my depression didn't set until I was like 20 because I, I am able to remember not always feeling like this. And I want to argue with you about that a little bit at some point. Let's do it. Well, I mean, when you say it's not like this, I know... um, Unless you don't feel like it's appropriate to do it right now. No, okay, so it... it, Someone mentioned recently that they had, uh, like, a a psychedelic trip, and afterwards they kind of felt, like, um, sort of down about it because the after effects were, like, things seemed to have lost meaning, like, nothing's really all that important. And I was like, that's... Isn't that just normal? I mean, (laughs) that, that eventually you just have to come to grips with the fact that nothing means anything and we're all going to die. And, and you said that's like not normal, but I think, isn't, I think, isn't that just deluding yourself? And the, the practice of becoming human is realizing that none of this matters, but we go on anyway, because there's good stuff too. And that's, you're talking that's worth specifically it. about meaning, which I don't think is the same as things like depression. Uh, you don't think, I think they're like, related. You know, they're just like types of depression that are just for example i get anhedonic depression Hmm. where i just lose any motivation to do things even that i love that i have interest in like that's my style too i in this my this is going to be of course because with steven everything always goes back to the marvel cinematic universe (laughs) um when endgame came out i was nonplussed Hmm. like i was i i I, sh- I was stoked for months leading up to it. Then, like in the couple oh, months yeah. before that, I'm like, yeah, I'll see it when it comes out. And like, I th- it this, this it, it sounds it sounds like, like a stupid something's thing. Something's wrong, right? Yeah, sort of feedback. And it, it sounds like a stupid thing because it's a movie. But like this is this was a you know part of an experience I've been enjoying for the last decade and been hyped about. And then I'm like, you know, not excited about something I should be excited about. I'm like, wait a minute, I should be happy and excited about this. And like really making myself like have to and again it doesn't it, it wasn't just about the movie but it was me realizing like oh yeah i haven't played video games in a year i haven't like you know i i i don't enjoy uh like the parts of my job i used to enjoy like all the things it was kind of just like yeah, you don't what have I, a, a looking forward to a thing feeling anymore well i think or even enjoy yeah exactly or enjoying it when you're doing it i am strongly of the opinion that humans do have to feel like they're doing something that matters and uh and not having that leads to great depression. Like Some people you can do. be on antidepressants, but if you're just like kind of playing video games all the time and not doing anything else, you still get super depressed. And like one of the best po- times in my life was when I was doing the uh, Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality audiobook because I felt like I was doing something and contributing something to the world, and other people appreciated it. And 
now one of the things that keeps me going is like having these other two podcasts because they feel somewhat meaningful but it's i mean if you don't have some kind of project that you're doing or that you think your actual day job is contributing to human welfare it's really hard to not be depressed. So I, I think, think your we, typical mind is. I was just Am going I? to say those exact Shit. words. Okay. Um, uh, although I can completely relate because I have the same thing, but that's that's from my upbringing. Yeah, and and to be clear, that might be it might be typical among seventy percent of people or something. Mm. But like, I can be happy. Like yesterday, I played God of War for like five hours, and I had a great day. Yeah. No. Like, I mean, there's... and so you know, like, but the other thing too about being productive and having that add to happiness. One of the things I was talking to my therapist about was like, you know, he's like, well, what what have you done that you've accomplished lately? I'm like, well, I helped overthrow my old HOA board, and we're turning the community around. High five, whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. It, but like. You know, and then, you know, I've, I've got these two podcasts, you know, it's like, so what'd you do this week? I'm like, well, I recorded this one. Oh, well, how many, you know, that podcast, how many listeners? And, oh, you've got two of those. Well, you, you must be, you must be feeling pretty accomplished about that. And I was like, no, I'm not. Mm-hmm. I feel nothing about it. Like I, yes, I suppose if I were telling my younger self about like, Hey, these are the things you'll be I doing. I was trying to think about like, like I might, my younger self might be like, Oh, that's cool. I used but to now think that I, I wouldn't have... be able to like drive a car or have a job. Like I was just like, how do people do these things? I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to handle all that. <laughs> I think if I went back and told my past self all the shit I've done and I'm currently doing, I'd be like, wow, I'd grow up really cool. But in my like current state, I'm kind of like, man, I'm not doing anything. Not living up to my potential. <laughs> I, I told you about my, my theory of the, uh, what the, Causes the hedonic treadmill, right? I don't, I don't remember this. Let's go over it again, but I wanted to finish my thought oh, on yeah, the... Sure. Um, like, my, my issue wasn't that I... Like, well, I guess what I was getting at is that doing things might be part of the solution, but it's not the whole thing. Because, mm-hmm. like, I was doing stuff, and I just wasn't feeling anything. Hmm. And, like, I'm not, you know, 100% better, but I have noticed an improvement. I'm on a low dose of Wellbutrin, and it's helping. Yeah, um, you know why that is? Uh, dopamine is actually the reward chemical... Yeah. So if you're low in dopamine, regardless of what you're doing, your brain's anticipating getting a reward signal for having done it. When you keep not getting it, then your brain down regulates your desire to do that thing. Yeah. And that, that's part of why I selected it too, why I wanted the dopamine one rather than the serotonin one. Yeah. Um, like, Maybe I should it, change the dopamine. Uh, experiment talk to your doctor. for sure. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, obviously with like medical supervision, but yeah. a lot of people have been on just whatever SSRI or whatever they got prescribed. There's a lot of newer ones. Um, there's a lot of other types of drugs that aren't SSRIs. Um, Modafinil treats a lot of people's depression. Um, It's a wakefulness agent, but the thing is that it elevates orexin and histamine. Just having sometimes that boost of extra energy is what people need to like get up and start doing things. And then once they start doing things, the feedback loop kickstarts itself. Doesn't the histamine also give you more allergic reaction type stuff though? Uh, Histamine, just it's a neurotransmitter like uh, serotonin or dopamine. There's actually... Like, there's a bunch of different serotonins. Serotonin is responsible for nausea. That's why uh, when you take on Dancitron, it's blocking... What is it? It's blocking one of the serotonin receptors. Um, HT3, I think. Hmm. So, like, I actually am a little bit um, frustrated at the neurotransmitter model of various mental illnesses because there's a lot more going on than just neurotransmitters. And we don't even, like, have a proper understanding of what they do again like dopamine the reward chemical but like people think of dopamine as being like the happiness chemical and serotonin is like the calmness chemical Mm. and no (laughs) histamine can give you an allergic reaction can calm it down can make you awake can regulate your sleep yeah anyway (laughs) pet peeve um tangent i i hear you i was gonna say too about just like the um you know meaning and mattering like a lot of the words you're using about happiness i think I mean, that actually might be where some of the happiness hypothesis that book I was mentioning comes in. Like, I think he pulls every chapter from, like, quote, ancient wisdom. You know, like, Boethius wrote his uh, meditations the day before he was executed. Oh. And I think that's in the book. Okay. Um, He was laying and he was sitting in prison and he, who knows how much this is, you know, uh, allegorical or not. But, like, it is possible, I think, in principle, for a human mind to be happy, even knowing that you're going to die in two hours or... Um, now I don't know if that'd be possible for my human mind, but like it's By allegorical. Did you mean not necessarily literally true? Yeah. I think you might've meant to use apocryphal. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. See, yeah, I appreciate <laughs> it. How dare you correct me? <laughs> Fuck you. Um, no, uh, I, I knew when I said it, it didn't sound right. I think that's why I said the word slowly. Um, yeah. So I, but it might be true. I have no idea, but the point is like, uh, it, I think it's tough because like, it, I don't want to like just push past the meaning and mattering and saying you're asking the wrong question, but it might 
not be the most useful framing because like if you're saying oh well i need to have a meaningful impact on the future light cone of the entire universe it's like well then good fucking luck so like if that's your goal manage your expectations a little better but also <laughs> that's just, why i need to live forever it's very hard to <laughs> impact the future light cone when you're not around you For, can't not impact the future that's like, true just by existing you're changing things and, but um uh, sorry, go on, Stephen. Uh, uh, no, sorry. I was just gonna say, like, for for what I do, like, what actually like helps make me happy is like making other people happy. Not to the point where I'm making myself miserable. That's the lesson I learned, you know, a decade ago, <laughs> oh, where you're God. stretching yourself too thin. I'm still but, working on that one. I'm you know, the like, worst people pleaser. <laughs> I, I I'm not much of a people pleaser. More of like I just try to like, you know, like, uh, like you give all your spoons away. Well, no, not even that. That that that's that that's the that's the bad part. Like, you know, um pass a downed car on the highway and it's like oh yeah you need to push the gas station i'll get out and help you push like little things you know if i'm not you know if i say if i'm in a rush or something and i can't but like that's the sort of thing where like if someone did that for me it makes a big difference and it's like i know that you know the the little things i do i try to make that i try to do for people that those experiences hopefully impact them in a positive way for the rest of their lives and that makes the world literally a better place um grant granted on a smaller scale that doesn't necessarily impact the cosmos at large but like it that that is the scope of my ambition for now is just to like try and make the the world I interact with better. Um, but I just I just see where you're coming from with the the larger existential question, nihilist, you know, yeah. uh, uh, the the crushing hammer of, of nihilism looming above you. But <laughs> what, what were we going to say about hedonic treadmill? Um, we got derailed. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, that someone once said that uh, happiness is what it feels like from the inside. Uh, the algorithm updating to uh i expect a greater reproductive uh outcome in the future <laughs> like this will help my my reproductive chances uh going forward at least in the ancestral environment right? someone does not understand happiness <laughs> <laughs> i don't know like every single time i've done something to be happy like when i look back on it i'm like in the ancestral environment this would have either brought me more resources or more status or just more lovers so i guess all these things do technically increase my uh my potential for reproductive success and and uh since it's an actual predicted increase in reproductive success that means eventually you're at the level of reproductive success you've reached and so you drop back to normal to be happy you need a predicted increase in success in reproductive success yeah. so you always need to chase more to get can the I, happy uh, feeling but i don't know if any of that is true it's just my own little bullshit thing well, can i say something about that <laughs> yes please the, there's a phenomenon where if you um, survey people in developed countries versus like what they used to call the third world um, and people living in hunter-gatherer tribes, uh, people are much more depressed and much more um, undergoing like different kinds of psychosis. There's, you know, more anxiety, depression, uh, mania, so forth and so on, gambling addiction in developed countries Hmm. um, with the more connectivity as well. So like, You're correct. I mean, we did evolve to live in small, like, familial groups or small tribes. Yeah. It it was... Where the things you did mattered. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't... um, Like, strangers weren't really a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, You sort of know everyone's status in the tribe. And, yeah, exactly. Like, you you contribute because you had to. And if you did, then you were doing your job and you're a good human. You know, kind of like the dog needing a job. It's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, humans also have this feeling of needing a job. Um the job, quote unquote, you know, in parentheses, doesn't have to right be be literal working yeah. for the man. Yeah. But like, it feels like you do need to do something, f- maybe for others. I mean, specifically, I think you would get like a big reward signal from doing things for others because mm-hmm. you're advancing the goals of the tribe, and that would increase everybody's like survival and reproduction so that- uh, resource rates. Yeah. So a lot of people are now able to compare their lives to everyone's lives on Instagram Hmm. where everyone's lying about how happy they are and everything anyway. But like, yeah, we're like bombarded with visions in the media of perfect bodies and, you know, like unrealistic, unachievable, uh, perfect lives. So it's like, literally there's, there's unachievable goals that are sort of being presented as the norm or the thing everyone's trying to achieve. So yeah, that's a recipe for misery. But there's also just so much more like feeling of not belonging that people have. You don't have a tribe. Um, do your actions matter to like the world at large? No, it doesn't feel like it. So that is really isolating. And we're like uniquely bad at dealing with that. Hunter gatherers, even if um well not even hunter gatherers, let's talk about like agrarian societies. They live kind of miserable lives comparatively. Um, if you think about just like, you know, 
backbreaking labor from dawn till dusk, eating simple foods, having shitty clothes, not having like really any sources of entertainment. But a lot of people in those societies are, they suffer from mental health much less, mm-hmm. uh, mental illness rather. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they have much better mental health because they're just living in more closely to the environment that they evolved to be in. Yeah. So part I of, s- I think, the issue here is just going to be like some kind of brain hacking. <laughs> I, well, right now, until we can hack brains, I think one of those other low-hanging fruit that everyone needs to grab is to see some other humans regularly, like have them be the same humans. And I mean, ideally, see other humans in person at least once a week for a few hours, which I know is harder now with COVID. But I think there's some level of health, mental health, that you just absolutely requires that. And yeah. like we we meet up for this podcast in person now when we can and i think that helps a lot we have our monthly less wrong meetups that we started up again outside and that helps a lot like i just think we we're social we have to have some social interaction or we start going crazy like like the dog that's never let outside yeah and i i'm fortunate to have uh you know a cohabitator that i love living with um I have a coworker who actually I have two, but I only mainly talk with one because we have opportunities to collaborate once in a while. And it could be a 10 minute collaboration, but we'll usually stretch it out. Like just the time we're on the, on the call together for like an hour. Mm -hmm. And that's mainly uh, because I'm mindful of the fact that he lives alone and he's probably going insane. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, you know what? Hey, let's chat, let's talk, let's hang out. Like what are you working on? What are you doing? And you know, it helps that we have a lot in common stuff to talk about. But like, as long as far as like the work specific stuff, we can knock out in a few minutes, but then we'll just stay on and chat while we're both doing something separate. Um, and yeah, I mean, right now it's, this is not a good atmosphere for mental health, uh, you know, flourishing, but it's never a bad time to think about it and what steps you should take to try and make things better. Um, I, I thought I had a thought on like the hedonic treadmill or something other than like, I, that's not how I experience happiness. I think, um, I mean, it could be, you know, if I, if I feel happy when I do something nice for somebody that to my apish hindbrain could be like, aha, you've curried favor among your tribe and you're seen as somebody who is uh, valuable to the community. Therefore you'll get laid. Well done lizard brain. <laughs> um, but like that, I mean, that's the thing. It, it's like our art. Now Wes would be making fun of us for Evo psych. <laughs> right. Um, and like, I'll fight Wes about Evo psych. Any day. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of those funny things. Like we're, we're not, we're, our brains are shaped by evolution, but our, our, our modern minds aren't even aware of it. Like, otherwise, I think this this sounds like a Steven Pinker quote, where it's like, otherwise, the most uh, fulfilling activity any man could do would be donating sperm to a sperm bank. Right, right. And it's like, since most of us never do that, yeah. like, we're clearly not driven by our evolutionary impulses in a way that actually increases our fitness. Well, there were no sperm banks in the, ever, in the ancestral environment. Right. Otherwise, but, maybe that'd be all we're doing. But now, intellectually, we know that, like, hey, I could sire offspring that I don't have to take care of you know, where do I sign up? But mm. none of us really give a shit about that, right? No, not even a um, Yeah, your brain doesn't actually track the, like, you know, that that's the whole, like, we're reproductive fitness maximizers, but there's all these, like... We're adaptation executioners, not yeah. fitness yeah. maximizers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you can sit there and eat, like, four candy bars, and the stupid reptile brain's like, yeah, all those cheap, <laughs> easy calories, man, we're gonna have so many babies. <laughs> like, <laughs> And yeah, no, uh, <laughs> obviously there's parts of our brains that are unsuited for the modern world. I had one more thing and this might dive us into uh, CBT a bit because I want to talk about that for sure. Um, the uh, Our Swedish friend wrote in and said, um, well, I, well, I'll read the whole thing. It says, I'm a pathological liar, both to myself and closest friends, promiser and under deliverer, permanent procrastinator. Um, I don't know what much to say about that. Uh, but I wanted to dive into the next sentence. It just didn't make sense of the previous one. Mm. I don't know how to handle it, and it mostly feels like I don't even have the energy to start. That is the one I identify with a lot, and I think that that's the the sentiment behind a lot of like just getting the ball rolling on tackling mental health stuff. What was funny, and I might have mentioned this on the air before, um, when I made the appointment, my first appointment with a psychologist in January, he called a few days in advance, and he was like, hey, do you still plan to keep your appointment on Thursday or whatever? And I was like, yes, that's why I made it. I would have called to cancel if I didn't. And I was just confused that he would, you know, even check. Like, otherwise, people just do that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they just show up or they charge you a non-showing up fee. And then he's like, okay, cool. I'll see you then. And then when I had a couple days to think about it, I came in and I was like, you called to ask. Because I imagine a lot of people say yes or say no when you call and ask that, right? And he's like, yeah, exactly. Hmm. I think because for some people, when you decide to take charge that is almost un- like that for some people that is the shove they need just to actually start taking charge they don't need they, they, they might need to do some more stuff on top of it 
but that decision to take tr- to take ownership of it, I think, actually helps a lot of people just it's such a positive by itself. Hypothesis. Uh, I think often people just who you know suffer from depression and have executive function things and just don't show up to their appointments. Fuck. And doctors' offices are or well, psychiatrists and et cetera are booked really tight. Um, I know my neurofeedback place. If I'm like five minutes late, then they have to put the next person in and reschedule me for another day. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're probably right. It's probably more the sad interpretation. I was thinking, I, just that kind of thing probably does also happen, though. Yeah, I maybe I, maybe I am just still too rosy about stuff. But you know what? If that keeps me happier, I'll I, I like to the your point where optimism. I'm not. As long as I'm not violating reality and and you know distrusting the truth, I'm going to stick with my optimism until That's proven otherwise. Part of CBT actually like forcing your brain to start having an optimistic pattern instead of a pessimistic one. Right. So let's let's talk a bit about that. And I think, like I said, I think you know a lot more about this than I do. Um, I want to talk about CBT at some length as much as you want but i think in correct me if i'm wrong in broad strokes it the the approach of it and you can go to wikipedia and look at like psychotherapy or something and it'll show you the the seven modern approaches the 15 you know historical approaches or something um i think most of those were just made up by one or two people you know 150 100 years ago or whatever and it's like those were in the wee early days of the of the field where no one knew what the fuck they were doing um Cognitive behavioral therapy to me is like, okay, let's let's identify what thought patterns are going on in your head and which ones are healthy, which ones are productive, and which ones are like actually accurate and teach you to be perceptive of them and how to address the, quote, the bad thoughts when they come up. Like a lot of people will catastrophize about something like, oh my God, if this happens, then I'm, I'm going to, uh, everything's going to be terrible. My job and then uh, my partner will break up with me and I'll just be a homeless bum on the street and then I'll die in a trash can. Right. And the, these, that'll pee in my head. <laughs> and and, and, <laughs> and these, these spiraling thoughts that catch you all the way, like catastrophizing turns out to like almost never pan out in the way that things actually happen. Like you lose your job and you get another one mm-hmm. is how, you know, life often works. Um, Pretty so, much every time. Yeah. Um, so, like, it's it's just one of those things where, I mean, catastrophizing is one example. Like, black and white thinking. Like, oh, it wasn't perfect. It was bad. And, like, not just being able to enjoy the part you liked There's or something. There's a whole right? long list of um, cognitive distortions. Let's let's take the wheel. Yeah. Gestures to Jace because no one can <laughs> see that. So, one thing I do want to point out is that there's a lot of different forms of psychotherapy that are science-based and have been developed for a long time and have efficacy for different um purposes like right now i'm doing internal family systems um that's the one where you have like harry has all those different houses in his head everyone has different parts of their brain that like how does that work i mean how how has it been working for you i guess is what i meant is it really well um because i have a lot of sort of different brain parts that have formed in isolation or like in opposition to one another and sort of it's like play acting these parts talking to each other or just like talk having the therapist talk to a part analyzing like okay what like caused this to uh, i realize i'm talking about ifs and not <laughs> cbt so um either way whatever works that's that's what i care about no, I, i'll talk about ifs some other time um i really like the concept behind ifs i just feel like i would feel silly trying to do it um you probably won't i mean you're a writer <laughs> so you already are used to kind of thinking about characters you never yeah, it's but, sort of like you're writing a story characters yeah but these are characters too i mean there's an extent to which you're like okay this is just me this is just the part of me that lectures myself when i like eat sugary things you've never done that thing where like not to sound insane but like where in methods of rationality harry like bifurcates himself into parts and it's lets not them argue insane. it out this, is, what, this is literally how brains I, work i love reading those sorts of things and that's among my favorite fiction where people do that or just you know due to science fiction reasons actually have multiple people in their head like face I'm, yes yeah. yes oh i love I that stuff point out crystal but, society yeah but no i've never actually done that in my real life it but, might be worth trying next time you feel anxious about I something i don't know if i can and and so you, you know <laughs> I, well i i don't know exactly how to tell people to get started with it but for like for me especially when something is very stressful part of me is able to do my regular life you know mm. make breakfast do dishes etc mm. well part of me is screaming in my head mm. and so like just spending five minutes or, or more but like just actually sitting down and kind of separating my brain out into different versions of myself and letting that one just like say what it needs to say and the rest of me like visualizes listening and looking at that person at that version of of see it sounds like i'm I, it, it, it sounds it sounds hokey um don't get me wrong but uh 
Like, oh, well, it sounds even hokier when I, I say that I do out this. That this is in... actually scientifically how brains work. You can take right. parts of the brain, like physically, and separate them from the other parts, and the person will like speak from the different parts individually. No, I, I totally. It sounds this. crazier when I say I do it in the council room at High Hrothgar from Skyrim. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, like Matt has. It uh, sounds excellent. Matt Freeman has like talked about this a number of times and like it is super convincing and it's how i try to model other humans as having various competing drives in them uh, and i know that i also work that way but like i've gotten so really good at being like no there's just this one unified me that it's 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 like a foundational myth of my inner society now and if i were to deny that who knows what could happen there'd be chaos dogs and cats sleeping together in my brain <laughs> can't have that <laughs> Um, the dog part of me says woof, but the cat <laughs> part. <laughs> yeah, we'll 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 dive into that at some point. Yeah, but CBT I don't get, though. Yeah. Um, I actually almost want to say that IFS is like sort of more advanced. CBT was where I got started and had like the most success with because it does really feel it feels very rationalist. Um, you do have a list of thought distortions. It's like the, I don't know, the 20 most common thought distortions. Those are catastrophization, the black and white thinking, blaming. Uh, Magnifying negatives. Yeah. Minimizing positives, which is the opposite of that. Um, yeah. Overgeneralizing, that sort of stuff. And so like what you do is you realize, I don't know, like you're, you're ruminating about something. Say it's uh, you're worried you're going to lose your job since we talked about that one earlier. And then there's sort of a, a grid um, where you go, okay, like you sit down and you're like, all right, what, um, thought distortions are going on right now? And you identify them and say, it's like catastrophization is the main one there. And you're like, okay, so let's actually look at this catastrophization. Um, what do you think is going to happen? And then sometimes like often it got to the point of me just like actually following the thought all the way to the end. That's why I was kind of like nodding when Steven was saying, well, sometimes you just have to get the thought out. And I'm like, well, actually, yeah, I mean... Sometimes you have this sort of like ball of tension in the back of your brain that you're just trying to not look at. Every time it comes up, you try to not look at it. But then when you really look at it, you're like, okay, what do I think is going to happen? You're writing it down. You're like, well, I'm going to lose my job. My partner's going to break up with me. And then I will run out of money and I'll be a hobo living in a garbage can and a cat will pee on my shoe. And you're <laughs> you like, said ahead last time. That's much worse. <laughs> I mean, like, I think just it really, you know, like, you're, then you look at it and you're like, that's absurd. Yeah. <laughs> and like, when, you, when you're actually looking at it, instead of just constantly trying to shove it away, then like, you can see, oh, that, that seems more improbable than I had been thinking. Or you can, if it doesn't seem improbable, you know, like, it seems pretty likely I'm going to lose my job. And then like, I, you know, my partner has told me that if I lose my job, they're going to break up with me. So like, but uh, you can be like, okay, well, like, you count what's the likelihood that this will happen. You look back at previous times when like you've been in this sort of situation, like what happened then? Was I okay? Did I make it out of it? Okay. Um, what are my options? Like you really can dig really deep into these things, but it's actually just taking the facts of the situation and looking at them objectively. And from there you can actually like the, the part of the technique is doing that and just like sort of calming down. Part of the technique is then reframing, towards a more healthy view like where you can say i'm i'm doing my best right now at my job i'm doing all i can if uh if i get fired then like there was nothing i could have done and probably i needed to get a job a different job anyway that's more suited for me if my partner really does break up with me then like that sucks but oh well they're not supportive so yeah. <laughs> uh and like you sort of that's not even like a very good example that's sort of just a no, that's like a realistic look of things as opposed to the cat catastrophic view. But then you can sometimes be, okay, um, my thought is my coworker hates me. Okay, uh, how do I know that? Well, they didn't say hi when I said hi this morning and they gave me a dirty look. And it's like, okay, uh, you look at past interactions you've had this with this coworker. They've all been neutral or positive. What are the chances that this one negative one like is happening? Why would they hate you? Like what? And uh, you can reframe as, I'm sure they're just like having a bad day and probably we're, or like, you know, maybe we're just completely spaced out thinking about something else that they're upset about. I'm sure it has nothing to do with me. And I predict that next time that I say hi, they'll be like, oh, hi. Yeah, sorry. I was just having some bad thoughts about something. So basically I, cognitive behavior therapy is a great tool. Yes. Yeah, and I have a quick anecdote actually about that last one. And so on, on at a high level, like... Part of the CBT thing about like reframing things, it almost sounds like lying to yourself. Be like, well, let's just look at the positive side. But while that sounds like 
when especially when you say it in that tone of voice, wishy washy and pointless, like there actually is a positive side to things. Yeah, and, and if you're predisposed to look at things negatively, then right. sometimes bumping it in the other direction is where you need to get to be to like be normal and yeah. D- disqualifying the positive is actually one of the like main uh, what were, what were we calling them uh, cognitive distortions, where it's like you don't get to appreciate the positive thing because it's not perfect or something, right? I think that is uh, one like a. Uh, what was it? Rejecting the good for the perfect? Yeah. Don't, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah, I think um, that's actually more of a pithy saying than a cognitive distortion, but yeah. Well, I think disqualifying the positive is on the Wikipedia page, but yeah. um, and it's something that I've definitely noticed. And there, man, I could actually go on at length about a tangent that's related to this. But related to the coworker <laughs> thing, I have a similar example, and this is how it pays dividends in real life. So like, at my first job, I had a very smart coworker who loved to like, vo- you know, jump in and help you help you learn something and understand something. At my second job, I had a very smart coworker who never did that. And I'm like, maybe he just doesn't like me. <laughs> um, and then I, then I, so I thought about that and I was like, well, hold on, let's think about another explanation for this. Maybe he just doesn't like volunteering to teach something. And so the next day I tested this empirically by asking him to show me something that he was working on. And he very enthusiastically showed me and explained what he was doing. Yeah, and it was awesome. Probably and just never occurred to him to do it. Exactly. And so like, the, the, it's this sort of thing where it's not just like, putting you know shiny bow and string on this on the shitty reality that actually is you might actually uncover that reality is much better than you thought it was based off your first and first thought and what were you going to say a minute ago Vinyash? oh um um real quick there might have also been another reason that he oh, i'll get back to that in a second another reason that he might not have wanted to jump in and explain things is like i personally am much less likely to explain things nowadays because of the fear of being called out for mansplaining things <laughs> And I don't want to take this culture war stuff, but it's just like, you know, that it doesn't have to be a culture wars thing. Like I, I could see that maybe this is a nerd who's been trying to like talk to his brother about like programming and it's just like, oh, shut up, dude. Like you're always talking about functions and whatever. Yeah, <laughs> I've got I'm just bringing that up because I've gotten that from like my sisters or my peers growing up when I would be excited about an animal fact. And they're like, oh, my God, shut up about alligators. <laughs> yeah. It, it could well be that he didn't want to come off as uh, condescending or something too, which yeah. is, which is valid. But or when I expressed anxious or shy. Yeah. But when I expressed an interest and, uh, you know, gave him an opportunity to talk about it, he was enthusiastically responsive. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, there's all kinds of reasons why he might not have done it. But the point is, is that the reason that he didn't, didn't appear to actually be my first thought, which was he doesn't like me. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I was just kind of looking over your shoulder, and I wish I'd pulled up the email myself, but I saw this line near the bottom. It says, he, the, the writer says, like, my mind is a tangled ball of yarn, and I accidentally fused the ends. When he's talking about, like, how complicated all this these problems are. And um, for a physicist, you're very poetic. Yeah. <laughs> which, I, which I really appreciate. That's also, awesome. Also, I doubt that English is his first language, and this is written. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm always really impressed by... Uh, I think it was actually, there was a Swedish person that I was friends with who spoke like, I forget if it was six or eight languages, and I would not have known she was not a native English speaker. Right. Very impressive. The The guy who wrote um, The um, Quantum Thief is Swedish, I think. Hmm. I'm very Still impressed with, that yeah. Oh, I yeah. recommended that a few times. It's good. Anyways, um, so I really feel that because there's sometimes you get in these situations and like, Maybe it's a bad relationship and you're like, I just fucked this up so much. There is, there is no way to recover from this. And brains feel very much the same way where it is so big and so complicated and so many things have gone so wrong. There's just, there's, you can't, it's too big. It's overwhelming. You can't fix this thing. But what I want to say is that's true. Brains are big and complicated and you can't fix that thing. But like, Maybe with uh, with the help of a therapist or CBT or uh, drugs or just implementing low hanging fruit grabbing, you don't want to fix the whole ball of yarn. You're just going to pick out one little thread. You're going to pull it out. You're going to straighten out that little thread, and that's going to be your project for the month. And afterwards, you're going to have a big old complicated messy ball of yarn with fused ends. But there's going to be this one little piece that's nice and straight, and that piece will be nice. And that's all you really want to do. I was also and, really poetic. Oh, well, thank you. I like that, yeah. And, and maybe over time, you can do another little piece in uh, some other month. And maybe at some point, you get something that is approaching some decent order that you can live yeah, with. Yeah, that's and a really Torturing analogies point. is a pastime of mine. It's like, <laughs> have you ever untangled a pair of headphones? <laughs> and like, you do it one small piece at a time. And what was originally this impossibly convoluted mess, like it, and it, maybe this is overly ambitious to say you can straighten out your entire, you know, everything in your whole life. You never but, can, but you can get many of them manageable. Yeah. Where right now it's this disgusting spaghetti mess, and it's like, no, well, you start with one thing. Yeah. And like, 
and depending on you know the state of depression like you know i i have a friend uh or a, a, a you know i whatever i know i know i know somebody um you know and like part of their i actually don't know if he would say he's depressed or not but i think he is like one thing he could benefit from and this is something i try to do you keep your house clean Keep, oh yeah, you know, and this this is like Jordan the, Peterson. I I know, no, but and, it is really a big deal. And, like, I know, I know. I, I'm, no, I'm not, are I'm you, not, have I'm, you seen my house? Like I'm I'm OCD about. I'm not I'm not a Jordan Peterson fan mainly because I, I he first came to my attention under like the insane religious bullshit that he's talking about on something, Sam Harris's something, podcast. Lobster hmm. transgender. Yeah, I never oh. I I never anyway. I never got on board with any of that stuff. But I think from my limited understanding of having read the synopses of some of his books on Wikipedia, he seems competent at the at the area of his actual domain which is like psycho psychology yeah um, i shouldn't have brought him up i like, know oh, it's fine <laughs> well but well as long as he's up i think his sentence is like clean your room mm-hmm. and it's like you know this is where you spend your time make it make it livable make it manageable and when it looks better you'll feel better and that just turns out to be the case yeah mm-hmm. i think um, you like phrased it more strongly which is like oh you have all these ambitious goals about how you're gonna be ceo how are you gonna be ceo if your room's dirty <laughs> I, I forget if that was him or someone paraphrasing him i just find that anyway i like that though it, it almost makes sense like how you know pick up your socks <laughs> yeah and i mean th- as far as that like the procrastination thing is real too i have a thing where like my kitchen and living room are all downstairs and my bedroom and, and uh, office are upstairs. Every time I go downstairs, I bring something downstairs that needs to go downstairs like dishes. And every I'm, time you do upstairs, you do the same. If there's anything I need to bring, but like, I never be like, oh, I'll get it on the next trip. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, get it this time. Yeah. And, and it's never always go somewhere with empty hands. And it's, it's a small thing and it, but it, it really, it adds up. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, it's, I think that's the step is like it, it, it there isn't going to be a fast track, pass to like the end of the line it's just every step along the way right yeah yeah um i actually wanted to say two things one was the the thing that was talking about the the tangled ball of thread metaphor um a really important thing to get a handle on is like and i'm working on this but like be kind to yourself i am the biggest dick to myself in my head uh i'm still really bad at it i've gotten a lot better at it but i used to talking about parts i used to have a part that was just in the back of my head being like you stupid asshole get up you know like lazy bastard pick that thing up come on like we gotta oh look like people are gonna laugh at you if you see that like it's just the the meanest like possible drill sergeant voice and i felt like that was a thing i needed for the longest time um in order to because i had this mental image of myself and some of it's like from my parents and upbringing of just being like you know lazy teenager who can't do anything right and always fucking things up um a lot of that really pushes down on your ability to cope though um and if your motivation is driven by like guilt shame anxiety that's not good (laughs) even if it does help you um i was like i did find that to be helpful um a lot of people have guilt motivations that's actually why i want to like plug replacing guilt again which goes much deeper into that whole idea of having extrinsic or uh, intrinsic motivation and using that to replace guilt-driven motivation um yeah like it's rough having mental issues uh and beating yourself up about it is going to just make things worse so uh, the other thing i wanted to talk about was this last line about I have no idea how many stop procrastinating videos I have saved in a watch later folder. <laughs> Lol. That's always the top comment. That's always the top comment on the Reddit thread about like, hey, look, there's this great TED talk on procrastination. Great. I'll watch, watch that. Later. I'll watch that yeah. later. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how often I've failed with the Pomodoro technique, knowing there are solutions, and I fail even when using them sucks. If your efforts aren't working, go deeper. But where is that? Where do you begin? Um, which, to which I also want to sort of say, first of all, like. Yeah, the, there's all these like stop procrastination tools. Pomodoro's one, getting uh, getting things done. The GTD system is one. Um, I started doing the Atomic Habits system, which is a book that I recommend. But um, yeah, you can watch all these videos, you can learn all these techniques. But the thing is, you have to apply them, and applying them is hard. And applying them consistently is really hard. Mm-hmm. And everyone who does this stuff, like the people who are the most obsessed with these, like me, you know, I have a special interest in these kinds of like life hack type things, usually are people that have executive function issues. Um, that's a really common thing. Again, if you look at the Slate Star Codex polls of um, trends in the community, there's a lot more people with acrasia um, or executive function things, which probably comes from the, there being a lot more people with mental health things, which probably comes from there being a lot more people with higher IQ than average, but that's a hypothesis of mine that i'll shove into a drawer for now um 
I think having social support systems uh, makes this much easier. Uh, one of the reasons I signed up for the Guild of Servants, which we had a two episodes back, I think, was because they do have like a social support system and a community. And like I would recommend getting into something like that if possible. Uh, I know I've said this before, but I think the military is one of the best institutions for making functional people out of fuck ups that there is because they not only like show you what you need to do, they will consistently give you a series of wins uh, throughout the, the training per, uh, yeah. training process. They like you tell you to do feedback. a thing. Yeah. You, they tell you to do a thing. They show you how to do a thing. You do the thing and you're like, oh my God, I did a thing. And yet, it may be something simple, like go dig a hole yeah, or whatever. Tie your shoes correctly. <laughs> right, right. Make your bed. <laughs> but but the, it's, I mean, we're, we're machines. We're biological machines. And we just keep getting that feedback where we did a thing and it worked. And you like realize it slowly gets hammered into your brain. I can do things which will have an impact on my life. And they work. And I'm good enough to do stuff. And it's really a fucking tragedy that the one institution we have that really <laughs> teaches people how to do this well also uh, teaches people how to kill other people in other countries because know, right? that's really fucked up that you have to make that trade off to get that. I would like there to be an institution that does the same kind of thing and has the same sort of like boot camp, no bullshit, Dragon you have Army. to do this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but that doesn't also require you to risk your life to murder others. So, um, yeah, I uh, that is a a tragedy of how that worked out because I'm ideologically opposed to doing something like joining the military. Yeah. But the other aspects of it all sound great. Yeah. It's just the the goal of it yeah. is not what I'm going for. I right? have I can't tell you how many times I've considered like joining, you know, doing boot camp and then like dropping out and being like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the life skills. Yeah. <laughs> but like, oh, um, I was still talking about the procrastination thing. Uh yeah, yeah, the the tools to go back to that thought for a minute, and then I kind of want to go to your boot camp thing. Uh, <laughs> the stop procrastination tools are like meant to, or rather, like everyone who does them does them successfully for a while, and then you like crash. Um, a funeral happens, and you've got like this big project coming up, and then like your sleep gets interrupted because your dog was keeping you up all night. Like whatever. Um, yeah. And then like you or just depression hits and you can't keep up with it and you have to just learn to forgive yourself, be kind to yourself, do self care. That's another important thing that should be part of this whole, like, you know, the basics, the low hanging fruit, self care, like get a massage. Like the whole, the, your issues are in your tissues thing is like, mm -hmm. actually, um, I have like chronic pain in certain areas that are, it's just from stress mm -hmm. or maybe it's not just, but like, I have like neck pain and lower back pain that is from tensing my muscles because I'm anxious and being able to sit and meditate regularly and to like push down the anxiety and the tension alleviates the pain in my body. You can also sort of do it, um, you know, the other way where if you get regular massages, it eases the anxiety and tension just because the you're relaxing those parts of your body. There's a feedback loop. Um, and that's, yeah. that's part of biofeedback, right? Is that the, um, uh, yes. And so, that is another aspect that I think I got like a head start in from like having to manage to where I wasn't, you know, yeah. clenching muscles and something because then I'd be crippled with headaches or, you know, whatever. So, um, it, you know, it's a bummer that it, it, the lesson had to come into me informally through that right. process. But on the, on the plus side, like I notice when I'm clenching my jaw, I notice when I'm, you know, flexing my hands or, you know, my shoulders are tense or whatever, like, cause I, I'm, not constantly, but frequently doing just a quick head to toe check in on my yeah, body to see how stuff is. And it turns out that like, um, flexing uncomfortably leads to like actual physical stress, which leads to mental stress. Um, and I think, what do they call it? Wagging the dog's tail <laughs> where like you, you can't wagging the dog. Yeah. Um, so it, it, like exhibiting the behaviors of a happy person actually makes people happier. I think. Yeah. Fake it till you make it. I mean, um, that was how I have managed to get over imposter syndrome in the different, like, I've changed careers a bunch of times in totally different fields, and I always struggled really badly with imposter syndrome, and I realized, like, what you do is you just, okay, I'm a librarian, um, this is my job, I'm doing my job as a librarian, <laughs> and, like, I'm doing the same thing as all these other people who are also librarians, and I, I, like, I'm competent, and I know what I'm doing. And if not, I can ask someone for help, or I can figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> and you sort of just have a mantra. I actually had to, when I was, like, walking into the library, I would, like, 
there was a tap which is a thing from like cfar strategies it's trigger action plan but basically it's like when x i will uh do y uh when i would get to the front step of the library i would smile i would like straighten my shoulders smile and then like walk in and try to like make eye contact with some of my coworkers or some of the like patrons of the library and smile and wave and say hi and just like project an air of like i belong here i am happy see you guys and like we're gonna have a good day and like stuff like that it, you know it, it does sound incredibly hokey but um but it worked it works i think i read a book back when i was first dealing with depression by richard wiseman called oh i can't think of it um it, i think it's only book on happiness or uh that sort of thing that he wrote so i could probably find the title we'll put it in the show notes um but like the he talked about like the experiment where they had people hold a pencil between their their teeth while working on something oh, yeah. and then other people like were to hold a pen with pursed lips or something and at the end they asked people how happy they were i think on average the ones who held the pencil between their teeth thus forcing a smile po- a smile uh kind of facial, grimace, facial structure but like yeah <laughs> yeah but it, but it pulled the lips back like Pulls this your smile muscles back like though they seemed to have enjoyed whatever stupid task they were doing more than the people who had to hold kind of the scowl to keep the thing in their mouth and they're both holding things in their mouths so like that that they controlled for that but did it yeah. replicate I don't know. Okay. I think those have, um, because I remember that there's been a bunch of different studies along the same lines about, um, well, hmm, actually, you know what? I'm not going to go out on a a limb and say that that has replicated, because I think I remember one about, like, power posing, not replicating. Right. That's always the first thing I got to ask now. Whenever I see a psych study, I'm like, well, question number one. (laughs) Anecdotally, I've noticed that if I'm in a bad mood and I smile... It actually makes me. It actually perks me up. I get. I, I notice a jolt of positive feeling in my brain. Yeah. Whether or not that's psychosomatic or not, it it works. Yeah. Well, um, it's definitely psychosomatic, but I mean that's the point. Let me. Yeah. Whether or not it. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like it, a, if it's I purely placebo or not. I always guess. have this thing of like, oh, it's all in your head. <laughs> where like, when, I, this usually comes up when I'm trying to like explain my thing with my parents. Where like, it's like, oh, you don't have ADD. It's all in your head. And it's like, I mean, like, yeah, where else it would it be? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, it's in my kidneys. <laughs> We are, uh, we've been going on for a while. Was there things that you guys wanted to mention before we wrapped up? Oh, this is a really good topic. Uh, and I'm, again, like, sorry to hear about the original poster's struggles, but I'm glad to have gotten the question because I feel like it's a good time to talk about mental health. Um, and I'm sure there's more that we could get into as well. This is definitely, you could probably tell, like, a special interest of mine, and I'd go on forever about whatever details so thanks for letting me rant about my special interest and i <laughs> hope some of this was helpful i i knew you'd be eager and equipped to talk about this better than me um i was eager but less equipped i think um i just wanted to say to say thank you for the, the listeners for writing in about this i think reaching out and talking about it is the hardest step and then the next step is taking action and you know if you want to if you want to talk more over email or something I'm i'm open to it i can't therapize for you but i can give you the nudge to go get therapy um and you know what whatever it is uh like the and again therapy might not be a magic bullet but it's something that just talking to a professional and and this is i i always equate it to like you know um physical ailment you know if your leg is bothering you you know you can try to look up a youtube tutorial on you know if, if, well, what do leg i do stretches. What, what do i do about a sore knee yeah leg stretches etc um but there's nothing wrong in fact it's almost nonsensical to say i'm not going to go see a doctor about it it's like well why not especially if you're in sweden you've got medical access <laughs> um so like yeah sorry people from the u.s but you know <laughs> in, in a pinch sometimes seeing a doctor in the u.s is worth the visit um but well i'm, I'm being tongue-in-cheek it is like it you can try and fix it yourself but like why not just get a professional opinion on it and if they can't fix it for you on that trip they can at least give you some nudges in the right direction right yeah. and more often than not hopefully yeah. so i think just just reaching out and and seeking help is the is the only major piece of actionable advice i can give so yeah, i'll take that a step further and say just take an engineer's approach if you find a bug throw everything at it like attack it from all angles get a checklist sort checklists of checklists are huge yeah okay they feeling can depressed very motivating. what can i do um you know therapy medication um regulate your sleep better wear like you know blue blocking glasses at night cut down on the caffeine exercise daily it's like try all the things and try the things like 
in combination with each other because generally it is a combination, you know, of stuff that you're doing yourself, like the diet, exercise, meditation, sleep, um, a drug, and therapy. It's going to be like probably the most powerful combination until we get legalized psychedelic therapy. Hmm. Which is, <laughs> I had to throw that in there. I don't want to talk about it for the entire episode, but MAPS, uh, the Psychedelic Research Institute, is their studies of curing mental illnesses or making significant progress with a specialized combination of psychedelics and therapy has shown remarkable results, and I'm super excited about it. Cool. And I'll stick some info in the notes <laughs> but i'm not gonna just start talking about psychedelics now because that'll never end <laughs> i would like to point out that uh a lot of people say and this is true that like just taking the action is is very hard like taking that first step is tough uh and i want to point out to the uh, writer of the email that like they've already taken the first step they they've moved into action by writing us an email that is doing something and like now just keep that momentum going and take that next step with the the movement you've already started oh yeah and i did um i forgot in the beginning of the email they had mentioned that um they're not on the discord but might join soon yeah i'd recommend um if you have the time for it uh join the discord and i'm sure that like you'll find there's a lot of people with this interest the there's people on um the sort of sister discord uh the what was it institute of bays university of university bays. of bays yeah who talk about this stuff a lot more too but you definitely can find people to compare notes with or to vent to or maybe help other people with some of their problems if you happen to have a solution and yeah, yeah. community is great and just have a community when you're stuck at home yeah, yeah. and a community of like rationalists <laughs> because uh it that, was, you had mentioned uh i'm so tired of talking to people who don't want to get it yeah which was well phrased and yeah no uh i feel you there's times i want to go off on things and like i just i rest restrain myself from doing it on facebook and then i come to the discord and i talk with people who are actually sane and i'm like oh that felt so much better i didn't have to go on sane a rant people. or anything it was just a nice conversation although i will say as nice as the Discord is, and sometimes it can be a lifesaver, it's still not quite a, a sub... A, it's not a true substitute for face-to-face -face physical interaction with humans. Right. And yeah. I guess, oh, so last thing, I know we're, we're kind of doing our wrap-up thing for 10 minutes, but... Um, <laughs> As we do. On, That's why on, I start them early. <laughs> on the path to progress, there will be stumbles and back steps. That doesn't mean failure. Yeah. It just means pick yourself up and keep going. Yeah, pretty common. Two and, steps forward, one step back is the pace. Yeah, mm -hmm. and but but every step back feels like, oh, this isn't working, or oh, I might you know might as well just give up. Um, and I'm not yeah. saying this as like this is how you will feel, listeners. Um, I'm saying this is just how it feels from the inside in my experience, and apparently what the textbooks say. Um, the, the, like it's push past that. Um, it it that that is the anticipated experience of like the the process here. And so when there's a stumble, just say, oh, that was one of the stumbles I was told to expect. I'm yeah. going to keep going. Um, it does not mean failure. Just like, you know, like Jay said, you were saying, like people who practice uh, procrastination techniques stick to them for a while and then stop. You know, maybe they've then upped their, pr their ability to not procrastinate a bit in the time that they were practicing te the techniques deliberately. But like tapering off or giving up on them doesn't mean necessarily failure and they're yeah, going to just revert failed. it just means like maybe you got to take a break for a while do some self-care yeah uh what was it the dave allen the gtd author actually um has this surfing metaphor where he's like think of it like surfing it's fun you ride the wave you crash mm -hmm. <laughs> you fall off you pick your board back up you get back on uh and like that falling down is part of the process as well uh just try not to get stressed out by it Awesome. Thanks for vindicating me. Like I said, I know you're the expert, so... <laughs> I don't know um, if I'm an expert, but it's special interester. Yeah, that counts. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't have... I think that's about it, but any any further conversation anyone wants to have, you can, you know, hit me up on the Discord or write us in at the email at the... Uh, I always get them confused because the website and email don't match up. The email address is... BayesianConspiracyPodcast at gmail.com, I think. That's the one, yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, Perfect. I think that's all I've got to say for now. But yeah. thanks again for writing in. I really appreciate it. And we do also have, in addition to the email and the Discord, a subreddit, which is not used nearly as much now because most people may migrated to Discord. But Sorry, every now and then, yeah, <laughs> every now and then, there is still something that shows up at the subreddit that you can check out, or you can rate and review us on any service that you use to listen to us. Yeah, I mean that that's not a way to get in contact with us, but it is appreciated. Right. That reminds me one more thing. I, I as far as a quick technique that I got a lot of value of that took three minutes to read and, and implement was uh 
post on Less Wrong by a friend of the show, Matt Freeman, um, or didn't mail on Less Wrong, Matt. on spamming micro <laughs> intentions. Um, I, I, it, 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 it was like a, it's this bizarre little brain life hack that I got a lot of mileage out of very quickly. Where you're thinking about, oh, I got to do this thing, and then you just you think of that thought, and then you just kind of ignore it or try to suppress it, or like you subconsciously just. But, like, this other thing is attracting my attention. I should think about that. Right. <laughs> your so, brain slides off it. So the idea of spamming a micro-intention is just to keep telling your brain, you know, like, you know, raise your left hand. And, like, you think the thought, and then eventually you kind of just want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you, but the idea of just spamming it over and over and over really quick for a few seconds is usually all it takes. And then you finally just do the thing. Um, I mean, I use this technique to finally, like, start doing, like... I think in the in the post he gave you the example of doing push ups. So I've been doing push ups every night for like the last year oh, cool. as just like a way to prove to myself to continue to prove myself that this works. And the cool <laughs> thing about it is that like once you've been spamming micro intentions for a little while, you get like this even faster track to like achieving whatever he's trying to do because you know at the end of spamming micro intentions you're gonna just do the thing anyway. <laughs> so as soon as the idea occurs to you to do, to spam micro intentions, you just skip straight to the end and start doing the thing. <laughs> yeah, I might as well get it over with. Right. I have a, an cool. addition to that too, which I forget where I read this, but it was really useful when you're having a lot of trouble getting started on something and feeling a lot of resistance to it. Along with trying just spamming the micro intentions, it, it's really helpful to ask yourself, when will I be ready to do X? And Sometimes, like, framing it that way um, will calm my brain down because it's like, I think there's usually the, oh, my God, I don't want to stop whatever I'm doing right now. Or I don't want to do this right now. There's this, like, anxiety about, but, like, you could be like, okay, in 10 minutes, um, I'll go get a shower. Cool. And then you can stop having the, like, repetitive thought uh, or, like, the repetitive aversive thought, rather. I hadn't heard that one, and I like it. All yeah. right. It's, it's helpful if the micro-intentions thing, it, like, if you've tried that and you're stuck or, yeah, if you're finding lots of, like, aversion coming up. Anyway, and that, that's the thing too. I should mention that maybe spamming micro intentions work abnormally well for me, and it won't work abnormally well for everybody else. But with a lot of these, your mileage will vary, which is why it's nice to have a community slash navigator through the in the form of a therapist that you know helps navigate this terrain. So, mm -hmm. anyway, what was the thing you wanted to talk about, Inyash, before we wrap up? So, a small piece of follow up from an episode several episodes ago, which is very timely right now due to the wildfires that are happening in California. Uh, I am harkening back to the episode where I said that. Uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is not doing themselves any favors by painting all police as like uh, death squads that are roaming the streets hunting down black people because yes, there's huge problems with the police and they need to be reformed and the black people are uh, adversely, not adversely, uh, disproportionately affected by this. Uh, but, but giving people the impression that there are these death squads makes things worse because when people who didn't know about it find out about this and then later find out that there aren't death squads and this isn't what it's like they are turned off because they were lied to uh i think a similar thing goes down with uh global warming and the fires that we're having right now because uh, as uh i'm not sure how many people are aware i think it's been being yelled a lot recently that uh the primary motivation the primary cause behind the wildfires is the land policy that has been in effect in the u.s for about the last hundred years where it's been we must suppress all wildfires uh that happen anywhere and uh, that is unnatural for the West Coast because they have a fire-based ecology. And so a lot of dry kindling has uh, built up over the past hundred years. And yes, global warming is bad. Yes, global warming will have bad effects on billions of humans and does change the climate as well. But the wildfires aren't because of global warming. And when people find out that easily find outable fact by hearing about the hundred years of land use policy, and uh, also see all these people saying, look, the wildfires are happening because of global warming and find out that's not true, then they might go, well, is global warming not even a thing then? Should this be something I don't need to worry about? Because obviously people are willing to lie and say anything in order to get me on board. And uh, that's that's a problem. Like you lose credibility when you lie, even if it's for the greater good, even if you think this will motivate people to address global warming, which really is a real issue. Yes, it really is a real issue, but lying to people to motivate them always backfires and like don't don't do that that's shitty i think that's a good point i um i think i was under the impression that wildfires are worse now because of global warming than they were 10 years ago well i mean um, they're worse but it's not because of global warming it's because of the yeah that's, yeah, that's what i'm saying so I, I, I had the wrong impression there um like it can <laughs> exacerbate global warming uh or global climate change but mm -hmm. like what was it 
I, I um, feel like I cut Steven off. I was going to say, I just there was a great tweet that I saw screen capped on Reddit somewhere. It was like, the sky is literally the wrong color, and you're telling mm. us you don't have the money for a new green deal or something, and <laughs> which is hilarious and you know devastating at the same time. But it, it gives me the impression that like you're saying a you know clean energy bill would actually solve this problem, and no, it turns out it won't. Yeah, we yeah. need to change how we manage land on the west coast. That would solve the problem. Yeah, right? that's what I was gonna say. Uh, I took a picture where I had been walking on a nature trail, and some kid had like taken a stick and written "No more fires." And I just posted that on Facebook because I feel bad about never posting anything on Facebook. Hmm. And uh, David from Spear David <laughs> from the Discord and uh, other podcasts. The Mind Killer. Uh, edited the picture like it's, it, to say, like, no more wildfires, more controlled burns. <laughs> and just posted the edit. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, actually. like, But, like, yeah, exactly. You know. I kind of I don't like the controlled burns solution, even though I know that's the most natural solution because it still puts smoke and shit in the air. But at least a like regulated amount of it. Yeah, I I, I would much prefer like paying some company to go in there and clear out all this. But I think when you're talking about millions of, of anchor acres, yeah, I don't that know. That would if be that's using feasible. lots of equipment that burns like fossil fuels and probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's not a good solution. And either. also the trees, as like you pointed out, there is a fire-based ecology. Um, yes, they a lot need of that. evergreens need fire in order to germinate their seeds. Yeah, and just clearing it out would fuck the ecology up. Yeah, yeah. so that's probably a good place to stop talking about this for now <laughs> okay but i'm glad you brought that up because i had the wrong impression about it and um, i imagine I'm, I'm i imagine i'm not the only one so um yeah I, I i can't say i've lived in colorado for my whole life and this seems i think this is the worst fire season i've ever lived through here it's also a few years hottest... ago there was a really bad one i but... know in the early 2000s i don't remember exactly what year i think maybe 2004 it was after 9 11 but it was before the financial meltdown in 2008 so somewhere in the early 2000s uh there was a really bad fire season where like you could just smell smoke everywhere and i had i i, more, I think two days i woke up and there was a fine layer of ash on my car because it just literally fallen out of the sky uh i'm not sure if the season itself was worse that could have just been because the fire was of closer proximity to denver like i don't i don't have data maybe this is the worst fire season i i know that it that some of these have broken records in size anyway yeah we've broken uh, records for the hottest summer day um and also the earliest snow <laughs> yeah there was this weird thing uh the first week of september where it was 90 degrees on sunday mm. and then i think 80 something on monday tuesday high of 50 or high of 40 and we had snow on and the we, we had some snow yeah. i was outside and I, I was just like feeling the temperature drop by like 10 degrees 10 mm -hmm. degrees 10 i was just like this because is i nuts. heard i heard the um weather reports and i was just like i need to experience this so i, I spent that night like out like i was trying to be outdoors as much as possible just being like there's no way it's gonna snow it was so, I post so oh weird. my god it's gonna snow should i post the picture of the little snowman made drake made on the balcony? <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes <Okay>. please <laughs> it's itty bitty but it's cute that's perfect yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, climate change, definitely a real thing that is happening. Yeah. But don't lie about that. And I think I mention this every time, but Dan Dennett has that quote that I should get a bumper sticker of and so I can just stop saying it. But there's nothing I dislike <laughs> more than a bad argument for a position I agree with. Yeah. <laughs> and, and related to that, there's nothing I like more than, than like fake evidence for a position that I agree with. Yeah. And it's like, yes, this is actually a problem. But every time you lie about it, you're making us look wrong mm -hmm. that the truth doesn't need you to lie for it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Think a patron? Yeah. Oh, this is an interesting one. Okay, so the patron we would like to thank that helps us bring the all these things that we've talked about to everyone here and have this sort of community for all of us is The Pointless One. <laughs> thank you, The Pointless One. You are uh, fantastic, and everybody who is listening to here should like give a little cheer for you right now. You're not pointless at all. No. Thank you again, Pointless One. I was looking through our numbers in the last couple of weeks, and you've been a supporter for, I think, two years which is remarkable, and uh, wow. we really appreciate it. That might be as long as we've had a Patreon. It's something close to that. It's yeah. like that. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, I may have messaged you on Patreon to ask, but literally anything we can do for you, let us know. Um, I feel like we owe you one at we'll the very least. We'll beat up your bullies. <laughs> <laughs> we will deliver you donuts from Voodoo Donuts. The Voodoo Donuts are not good. Everyone in Denver keeps saying how great Voodoo Donuts are. You go they're there, they're fucking sugar bombs. You wait in I line, mean, that's the point. you have to pay with cash, and then it's like this this nasty, like I got the Homer Simpson. I know this is derailing, but, <laughs> but, it, but it was awful. Yeah, yeah. It, it was soaking wet from all like the... That's the, the sugar stuff. that they 
pour in it and over it and oh, nah. I mean, I guess if your if your taste buds have been so numbed by a a diet of American pop, which is just <laughs> ridiculously sugary, maybe and then it's good. But like, I couldn't eat more than a couple bites. It was oh yeah. I think that's the point. I think that they're just excessively decadent <laughs> it's not decadent it's like getting punched in the tongue <laughs> that's yeah i will say i found them overhyped and, and i was underwhelmed when i got to finally have their product so this episode is brought to you by the pointless one and voodoo donuts <laughs> <laughs> one of them donuts. is pointless and that's the donuts yeah. <laughs> yeah. The voodoo donuts they're too sweet they've got a great logo though yeah they're really fun like and what they named them and all this stuff. like the decor in that place is awesome like, i see why it's popular yeah anyway Cool. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and we'll talk to you again in two weeks. Awesome. Bye, Thanks everybody. again. Bye.